Satan, the enemy of God, is in reality the highest divine spirit. Hey guys, Steve here. In this video, we're going to be looking at how the entire New Age movement is actually satanic and Luciferian at its roots. And before we take a look at some research, I just want to make a few things really clear. I'm not saying everyone involved in the New Age movement is satanic, and I'm not saying every single topic or every single pursuit within the New Age movement is satanic. But what we'll be looking at is how the side of the New Age movement that has to deal with spirituality and has to do with the occult is entirely rooted in satanic philosophy. And this comes from, not me, but the founder of the Church of Satan himself. And the point of this video is not to fearmonger or to preach Jesus to you or something. Christianity could be false and it wouldn't even affect the point of this video. The point of this video is really just to encourage those who might be dabbling within the New Age movement to follow the evidence where it leads and to turn away from things which might be dangerous or harmful. So with that being said, let's take a look at some stuff. So to start off, one of the most famous occultists in history is someone named Anton LaVey. He has been called the Black Pope and the father of Satanism because he is the one who founded the Church of Satan and brought it to the Western world as an organized religion. He is the author of the Satanic Bible, along with four other Satanic books, and he has an extensive background in the occult. In fact, he was the founder of the Order of the Trapezoid, where he used to give presentations on the occult and paranormal research, which later evolved into the Church of Satan. So the Church of Satan was birthed out of his interest and affiliation with the occult. When I first became Christian, I was a little overambitious, and I went out and bought the Satanic Bible, which I've since thrown out, to speed read it to see if I could find any parallels between the New Age movement and the Satanic Bible. And when I was reading through it, I was finding topics like the Age of Aquarius, Lucifer as the personification of enlightenment, Thoth, spirit guides, pantheism, spiritual rebirth through studying the mysteries, the all-seeing eye, being your own redeemer and savior through enlightenment. It sounded like a slightly darker version of the exact same topics that were discussed in the New Age. So I dug a little deeper and I found this quote by Anton LaVey. In the scores of books lining the shelves of New Age bookstores, there are instructions for guided meditation, creative visualizations, out-of-body experiences, getting in touch with your spirit guides, fortune telling by cards, crystal balls, or the stars. What if Satanists reclaimed these for their own dark purposes and integrated them into rituals dedicated to the devil, where they rightfully belong? New Agers have freely drawn upon all manner of Satanic material, adapting it to their own hypocritical purposes. But in truth, all New Age labeling is, again, trying to play the devil's game without using his infernal name. So some people hearing that might be offended, they might feel a little off-put by that, but this isn't coming from me, this is coming from the father of Satanism, who spent his entire life studying the occult. So I think a good question to ask might be, is it possible that he knows something that we don't know yet? As it turns out, the entire New Age movement has its roots in Satanic philosophy, and it was actually popularized and basically founded by a Satanist. And we're going to take a look at that right now. Some of you might be familiar with a woman named Helena Blavatsky. She is an occultist and a spiritualist from the 19th century who has been called the mother of the New Age and the mother of modern spirituality because of how far-reaching her impact has been on the New Age movement. She co-founded the Theosophical Society, which taught and published esoteric material pertaining to Theosophy. Theosophy, according to Wikipedia, refers to systems of esoteric philosophy concerning or seeking direct knowledge of presumed mysteries of being and nature, particularly concerning the nature of divinity. Theosophy is considered a part of a broader field of esotericism, referring to hidden knowledge or wisdom that offers the individual enlightenment and salvation. The society taught everything you could possibly imagine that could fall under the umbrella of the New Age, and really gave rise to the entire New Age movement. As New Religious Movement's research specialist from the University of California, Dr. J. Gordon Melton said, No single organization or movement has contributed so many components to the New Age movement as the Theosophical Society. It has been the major force in the dissemination of occult literature in the West in the 20th century. He has also said, Madame Blavatsky stands out as the fountainhead of modern occult thought and was either the originator and or popularizer of many of the ideas and terms which have a century later been assembled within the New Age movement. The Theosophical Society, which she co-founded, has been a major advocate of occult philosophy in the West and the single most important avenue of Eastern teaching to the West. So she was the major player in the popularization of New Age subjects. She would teach on things like ascended masters, ancient mythology, hermeticism, Hinduism, mysticism, scientism, astrology, sacred math, esoteric knowledge, chakras, Atlantis, Kabbalah, and every other New Age topic. Between 1887 and 1997, over 2,800 journals were published in the theosophical magazine she started called Lucifer. Yes, that's right. The mother of modern spirituality published her journals in her magazine, Lucifer. Now some of you might be like, wait a minute, Lucifer's not Satan. Lucifer is a symbol for enlightenment, he's the light bearer. I'll make another video in the future showing how, in scriptural terms, Lucifer actually is Satan. Lucifer became Satan after he fell. 
But we don't even have to go there because Helena Blavatsky herself calls Lucifer Satan. In fact, in volume two of her primary work, The Secret Doctrine, she glorifies and praises Satan well over a hundred times, calling him the one true God and the savior of humanity. So right now I'm going to read through some quotes that are in volume two of The Secret Doctrine, and I'll include a link to the entire book in the description of this video so you can go and read these yourself. Satan is the anointed cherub of old. God created Satan, the fairest and wisest of all his creatures in this part of his universe, and made him prince of the world and of the power of the air. Thus, Satan being perfect in wisdom and beauty, his vast empire is our earth, if not the whole solar system. Certainly no other angelic power of greater or even equal dignity has been revealed to us. It is Satan who is the god of our planet, and the only god. In this case, it is but natural, even from the dead letter standpoint, to view Satan, the serpent of Genesis, as the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. For it is he who is the harbinger of light, bright, radiant Lucifer, who opened the eyes of the automation created by Jehovah, as alleged, and he who was the first to whisper, in the day ye eat thereof ye shall be as Elohim, knowing good and evil, can only be regarded in light of a savior. Satan, the enemy of God, is in reality the highest divine spirit. Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost, and Satan at one and the same time. So here is the mother of the New Age, who has had the largest influence on this movement, praising Satan as the spiritual father of mankind and the one true God of this universe. Is it possible that he's the spiritual father of the New Age movement and the type of esoteric material that was taught by Blavatsky? Let's take a look at another major influencer on the New Age movement and popularizer of the occult, who some of you are probably already familiar with. His name is Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was a famous occultist and a 33rd degree Freemason from the early 1900s. He was a bona fide expert in the occult and has had a major influence on making esoteric material accessible to the West. He has also had a massive influence on Gerald Gardner, who is credited with bringing Wicca and witchcraft to the mainstream. In fact, the Wiccan rules and other witchcraft initiation rituals were taken almost word for word by Gerald from Crowley's material. He has also had influence on Timothy Leary, who claimed he was carrying out Crowley's work. Well, I've been an admirer of Aleister Crowley. I think that uh, I'm carrying on much of the work that uh, he started uh, over 100 years ago, and I think the 60s themselves. You know, Crowley said uh, uh, he was in favor of, uh, of uh, finding your own self and, and uh, uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law under love. It was a very powerful statement. I'm sorry he isn't around now to appreciate the glories that he started. And even had influence on Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan. The AA, or Argentium Astrum, is a spiritual organization he founded in 1907. Students would enter the order and then master certain occultic tasks and learn and study esoteric knowledge in order to graduate to the next level. If you were to be initiated into the order of AA, here are some of the things that you would learn about. Astral projection, Hinduism, Kabbalah, yoga, magic, non-duality, ascended masters, the tree of life, transcendental meditation, higher selves, Buddhism, mysticism, Gnosticism, sorcery, rituals of the pentagram and hexagram, tarot card to the zodiac, and many, many other topics that get taught under the umbrella of the New Age movement. There was a reason he was called by some to be a modern master of the occult, and it's because he knew what he was talking about. But like Blavatsky, he also had ties to Satanism. He referred to himself as the Beast 666, and once said, I was not content to believe in a personal devil and serve him in the ordinary sense of the word. I wanted to get hold of him personally and become his chief of staff. He has also said, for the highest spiritual working, one must accordingly choose that victim which contains the greatest and purest force. A male child of perfect innocence and high intelligence is the most satisfactory and suitable victim. For nearly all purposes, human sacrifice is the best. He has also said, it is, however, always easy to call up the demons, for they are always calling you, and you only have to step down to their level and fraternize them. They will then tear you in pieces at their leisure. Nevertheless, every magician must firmly extend his empire to the depth of hell. He has also said, This serpent, Satan, is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race, knowing good and evil. He bade know thyself, and taught initiation. He is the devil of the Book of Thoth, and his emblem is Baphomet, the androgene who is the hieroglyph of arcane perfection. So here's another major player in the New Age movement, calling Satan the god of our race. After being involved in the occult for over half a century and dedicating his entire life to magic, the spiritual mysteries, and the occult, he left this world a broke drug addict with the final words, I am perplexed. Satan, get out. Others say his last words were, I am perplexed, along with, sometimes I hate myself. With all due respect, do we really think that he was just a few more spiritual mysteries or a few more occult topics away from leaving this world in peace? Maybe if he hadn't left the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn so soon? 
or if he would have studied Gnosticism a little more diligently. He's the most famous occultist who ever lived, had a massive influence on the New Age movement, and left this world totally confused, hating himself, and may or may not have had Satan breathing over his shoulder. So why are the three most famous occultists of all time all mesmerized with Satan? Is this just a coincidence, or is it possible that Satanism and the occult actually go hand in hand? What if Helena Blavatsky was right, and what if Anton LaVey was right when he said, that New Age ideas and themes really belong attached to Satanic and Luciferian philosophy. To take a dive a little bit deeper, there's a website called Joy of Satan Ministries. It's a website dedicated to spiritual Satanism, and on their website you can learn about the following topics in depth. Astrology, auras, magic, self-hypnosis, incense, pendulums, runes, telekinesis, brainwaves, clairvoyance, past lives, chanting, the pineal gland, the chakras, bioelectric technology, the astral plane, spells, the kundalini serpent, and trance. And you can learn all of this stuff from their satanic witchcraft index, their information about the human mind, and their index of satanic meditations. Why would the Joy of Satan Ministries teach these things unless they were consistent with spiritual satanism? The ideas and themes of the New Age are the exact same ideas taught in spiritual Satanism, and that should be concerning to some of us. And these are the same ideas that were taught by Helena Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley advocated along a Satanic philosophy, and are the very ideas that Anton LaVey accused the New Age of stealing from the devil. Now, somebody might say, okay, maybe some famous occultist from the past had some ties to Luciferian philosophy or something, but we don't see that going on today anymore. The New Age has completely disconnected from any kind of ties to Luciferian or Satanic philosophy, and they have nothing in common anymore. Well, take a look at this. Mars looked very much like Earth a little less than a million years ago. It was beautiful. It had oceans and water and trees that were just fantastic. But something happened to them, and it has to do with something called the Lucifer Experiment. From the very beginning of creation, everything is simply an experiment. Creation itself was just consciousness creating and inhabiting itself in that creation. There is no divine plan. Spirit can do whatever it wants. Having said that, if spirit decides to cut itself off from the rest of consciousness and create a separate reality on its own, it can do that too. This is called the Lucifer Experiment. Because spirit is God, it can do this. There is nothing wrong with that. We've kind of been led to believe that Lucifer is evil and the devil. This just isn't true. Lucifer is just another means of perceiving the reality. It is not a unity perception of oneness, but rather a duality perception of two-ness. There's a flower of life pattern for Lucifer as well, but that's a big topic for another time. So here is Spirit Science, the largest New Age website in the world, the largest New Age YouTube channel in the world, a website I used to write for, showing signs of Luciferian philosophy that Helena Blavatsky advocated. And there's an article on the Spirit Science website that talks about this a little bit more. The Lucifer experiment, if you recall from the human history movie, was about a particular consciousness connected to the all who didn't want to play the same boring song. He wanted to be his own rock star, and so he split himself off from God consciousness and did his own thing, creating chaos and destruction in his wake. Now the reason this is showing up in the work of spirit science is because most of Jordan's material is based off of the material of Drunvalo Melchizedek, who wrote The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life volumes 1 and 2, most of which the spirit science series is based off of. So the largest New Age website and the largest New Age YouTube channel in the world right now is based off of material that, as we're about to see, praises Lucifer in the exact same way Helena Blavatsky did. And I'm going to read some quotes right now from The Flower of Life, Volume 2, and I'll include a link to that book in the description too so you can double check. Lucifer did not create free will, but it was through his actions and decisions that free will became a reality. It was God who created Lucifer so that free will would exist. I am in no way attempting to protect Lucifer or sanction his acts. I'm simply giving a new slash old perspective on what is behind what Lucifer is doing in the universe that, once understood, allows the possibility of transcending good and evil and entering into pure oneness with God. So this is basically saying that if you understand Lucifer's role in the universe, you can transcend the duality of good and evil, transcend the duality of righteousness and sin, and you can skip past Jesus and enter into a holy union with God if only you understand Lucifer's role in the universe. So evidently, with God's blessing, since he created him, Lucifer started on a great experiment to see what could be learned by creating in a different way from how God slash spirit had made the original creation. So Lucifer, according to this book, is also a creator god, just like Helena Blavatsky said. Lucifer told the angelic realms that we needed to do this experiment because the universe had missing information, and the only way to get the information was to live it. So yeah, the entire fall of angels that the Bible talks about, that's because God created a universe with missing information. And Lucifer and his angels apparently had to fall because there was, quote, missing information that had to be experienced.
So this Luciferian philosophy is right at the heart of the New Age movement and was at the heart of the New Age movement from the very beginning. So we have looked at how the father of the Church of Satan accused the New Age of stealing from Satan. We have seen the most influential man and woman on the New Age movement praise Satan and teach esoteric philosophy alongside Luciferian doctrine. We have seen how spiritual Satanists use New Age practices and ideas in their own devotions to Satan. And we have seen how Lucifer has even made his way into the spirit science series. And this of course begs the question, and this is the whole point of the video right here. Is it possible that the material taught alongside Luciferian philosophy is part of the same deception? Is it not likely that any material that advocates Lucifer or Satan in a positive light would be filled with lies and deception? So I think this should really make us ask the question, you know, is it possible that Anton LaVey was right? Is it possible that all of these lifetime occultists who started the entire New Age movement know something that we don't? Is it possible that maybe New Agers, like I used to be, were simply cherry picking from Luciferian doctrine and just leaving his name out? Well, stick around because we're going to look at each individual topic in the New Age on an in-depth basis to show that this is exactly what's happening. Because any subject or idea that gets consistently taught along a satanic or Luciferian philosophy should be questioned and should even be doubted. And so this is not about me trying to guilt trip people or fear monger or anything like this. It's just to present the possibility that maybe some people have followed a trail of breadcrumbs down the wrong path. And I'm not trying to condemn anybody or anything like this. I just want to encourage people into the direction of truth and away from stuff that's harmful or dangerous. Paul once said that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. And maybe it's the case that this is exactly what we're seeing within the New Age movement. If you've made it this far in the video and, and you're into the New Age movement, if it turns out that something's actually false and something's actually dangerous, we should be willing to just put it down and move on to the thing that corresponds with truth. The best definition of open-mindedness that I've heard is being willing to follow the evidence where it leads regardless of how it makes us feel. And my prayer and my hope is that those of you who have watched this far in the video will stay tuned and stick around and be willing to follow the evidence where it leads. Astral projection is the practice of willfully disconnecting your mind or soul from your body and traveling around in a parallel spiritual realm called the astral realm. This is the name given to a dimension right above us on a higher plane, though it looks the exact same as our natural world because it's the same universe just on a higher level. The metaphysical component of you that animates your physical body is believed to be an energetic imprint of your physical body, almost like a phantom or a ghost. And when this part of you leaves your physical body while your body is still alive, this is called astral projection. When outside of one's body, a person exists theoretically as a disembodied soul. So astral projection is the experience of being self-aware as this detached astral body or subtle body where you are fully cognizant in a normal state of consciousness, even though your physical body may be miles away from you asleep on the natural plane. These experiences are also called out-of-body experiences, or OBEs, because they involve the separation of consciousness and body. Eastern, Buddhist, and Hindu cultures have their own way of describing astral projection, but just like in the New Age movement, astral projection is thought as being evidence of spiritual advancement. For example, Aleister Crowley started an organization called AA, where mastering the astral plane while outside of your body was one of the requirements for graduating from the first order into the second. In Hinduism, astral projection is one of the siddhis, or paranormal abilities, called manojava, a spiritual attainment gained through right practice of yoga and meditation. It's believed to be a very ordinary ability that the spiritually developed are able to perform. Videos on YouTube with millions of views are teaching people how to astral project, offering various techniques and guided meditations designed to catalyze out-of-body experiences. It is by far one of the most popular practices in the New Age movement. The first question is, is this even possible? While the Bible by no means condones the practice of astral projection, it may have something to say about it being at least possible in theory. In 2 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul describes a vision he had where he was caught up to the third heaven. The word used in Greek here is harpazo, which is the same word he uses in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where he describes those who will be caught up in the rapture. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Paul describes two different times that whether I had this vision, in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Paul believed he could have been outside of his body when he had this experience of heaven, meaning we have a possible reference to a separation of soul and body prior to physical death. Biblically speaking, there may be a theoretical framework for OBEs, as the Apostle Paul thought this was a possible explanation for his vision. 
But there is a difference between God giving you an experience when you are in right relationship with him, and you trying to bring about this experience as someone who is not a born-again Christian. One is an involuntary experience given by God, so rare that it may have never even happened before in human history at the hand of God. And the other is a voluntary practice apart from God that the Bible condemns as sorcery or witchcraft. Galatians 5 condemns all occult practice as sorcery and says those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Revelation 21.8 says, But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In place of sorcerers, the NIV actually translates the Greek word pharmakia to those who practice magic arts. Magic is the art of producing a desired effect or result through the use of incantation or various other techniques that presumably assure human control of supernatural agencies or the forces of nature. And witchcraft is the art or power of bringing magical or preternatural power to bear or the act or practice of attempting to do so. Astral projection falls under major categories of spiritual sin and also commits the sin of idolatry by exalting ourselves above the place of God and deciding we want sovereignty over when our soul leaves our body. This practice is evidence that we do not belong to God's kingdom, but to the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, the prince of the power of the air, as Satan is called in Ephesians 2 verse 2. Satan's domain of existence is in the air, which refers to a higher invisible realm. The term seems to denote that evil spirits, who have some power of influencing us by their temptations, have their abode in the atmosphere, or at least haunt it, being invisible like it, yet exercising a real influence on human souls, and drawing them in worldly directions and contrary to the will of God. Both in ancient and modern revelation, the ministers of evil are exhibited as in the upper spiritual world, a true wonder in heaven. But the term is used here symbolically for the spiritual sphere only. Demons too exist in the air, or what Ephesians calls the heavenly places. As the Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In the heavenly places, or heavenly, taking heaven for the whole expansum or spreading out of the air, between the earth and the stars, the air being the place from whence the devils assault us. The phrase, in the heavenly realms, refers primarily to the sphere of the evil powers. So if Satan and his demons operate on a higher spiritual plane in between the natural realm and heaven, could the astral realm be the spiritual plane? Is it possible that astral projection might bring our spirit man to the realm that demons operate from? Maybe the astral realm is one of these heavenly places, an invisible air realm where Satan and his demons exist. At the very least, it brings us to a plane that they are able to enter into at will from their plane. After all, anyone in the New Age who has a lot of experience with astral projection is well aware that the astral plane can be occupied with all kinds of nasty entities. The New Age movement will usually refer to these entities as trickster entities or negative astral entities, but they retain the same characteristics and behaviors of demons in the Bible and are often identified as demons specifically. When you separate your psychosoma, also called the astral body, with your physical body, you might draw the attention of spirits or entities who reside in the natural realm. Depending on who you speak to, these demons look different. That's because they can shapeshift. Unfortunately, these demonic entities can appear to you in a form that you already trust, like your partner or a family member. Sometimes the demon won't want to fight you, they'll instead try and tempt you sexually. One New Age teacher admits that sometimes an entity that normally resides on the astral plane can come to you and stimulate you sexually for the purpose of swiping your energy. These entities can come to you against your will and essentially rape you. If you've ever been stuck in a sleep paralysis state and felt someone touching you in your special areas and got aroused even though you were terrified, you're basically being astral raped. The Ascension Glossary states, sadly, it is all too common for human men, women, and children to be subjected to astral rape during sleep state. Another New Age website tells us that the astral world is full of spiritual creations, but there you can meet also unkind beings and even demons. So many astral travelers use different protections for their physical bodies because when your spirit is traveling, they sustain, your body remains vulnerable. It basically is an empty vessel for demons and other beings. So the astral plane is already known for being a breeding ground for spiritual attack, which is what we would expect if the heavenly places are occupied by spiritual forces of wickedness like the Bible says. Because of the potential danger in the astral, we are told to visualize white light around ourselves or use positive affirmations to protect ourselves. We are also told that we only attract negative things into our experience if we are fearful, since there's this idea that we create our experiences with our dominant thoughts and emotions. None of this is true. In this video, we are going to expose this occult practice and allow the evidence to make it clear to us that astral projection is both dangerous and demonic. I want to share one of my two primary astral projection experiences I had, where I was pulled out of my body twice by an entity I can only describe as demonic. After this, we are going to look at eight different accounts of astral attack and see what they reveal to us about the nature of this practice, this realm, and the beings that inhabit it. When I was in the New Age movement, something I was deeply entrenched in was a practice called lucid dreaming, which is the act of being conscious and aware within a dream. You are essentially awake within your dream and have full control over your own body and mind. One experience I had lucid dreaming seemed so vivid and so ultra real that it surpassed the dozens I had before it. 
Nothing spectacular was happening, I was just driving my car in a local plaza by my house, but it seemed far more real than the average lucid dream. I reached a point where I thought to myself, I literally cannot distinguish between this being a lucid dream or real life anymore. And if I can't tell the difference between this and real life, how do I know real life isn't just one big dream? After what seemed like a minute later, the car I was driving in the lucid dream started glitching out as my dream became interrupted by an outside force. I got pulled out of the rooftop of my car and was still in my lucid dream, but I was now 30 feet above the rooftops overlooking my neighborhood. After a few seconds, a being appeared in front of me with red skin, a red cloak, and black markings on his face. He was standing about 20 feet away from me. He looked lizard-like, and although he was virtually humanoid, his jaw structure was different from that of an ordinary human. He stared at me with an eerie, creepy smile on his face for a few seconds before a third eye opened on his forehead. I began to feel my consciousness get sucked into his third eye, almost like it was a vacuum or a vortex, becoming more and more disoriented the closer I got. After I was fully pulled in, things went black and silent for about three seconds. When I tried to open my eyes, I found that I was no longer in my lucid dream. I was laying down in the air four feet over my bed. I sat up and looked around outside of my body, noticing that my room was being lit up by the light coming off of my astral body. My consciousness felt exactly like it does now except more sharp and more vivid because it was not being filtered through a physical brain. Nonetheless, I was scared to find myself pulled out of my body, hovering in the air. I tried to fight to get back into my body for the next few minutes by thrusting myself back down into my body and trying to wake myself up. I noticed that my astral leg was going in and out of my physical leg, which was laying on the bed, and my mind began to flicker almost like a broken light bulb as I began to get closer to settling back into my physical body. I began to pinch the leg of my astral body in hopes that I would wake up, but was unable to feel anything. When I finally entered my body, I found myself in a state of sleep paralysis where I was unable to move. A loud buzzing sound was taking place in the middle of my forehead, which I had learned from research was a precursor to out-of-body experiences. Knowing I was about to be pulled out of my body a second time, even though I had just fought to get back in, I opened my eyes and was once again a foot over top of my body. After another minute or so of struggling, I settled back into my flesh and was blown away at what I had just experienced. Here are a few takeaways from what happened to me. The red-skinned being pulled me out of my body without my consent. I got pulled out a second time against my will after I had fought to get back inside my body. I was doing all the protection techniques taught in the New Age movement for how to guard against unwanted attacks. I even had a Bible that I would sometimes put under my bed and even under my pillow, as I naively thought this would help ward off any dark spirits. Nonetheless, I still encountered one who was able to override my lucid dream and pull me out of my body twice. People think that demons in the astral realm will somehow respect us because we imagine a ball of white light around us or repeat a mantra of protection. Or they will think that we can only have scary experiences if we are operating at a low vibration, because fear apparently attracts more fear into our reality. Here is a story, however, of a woman who had nothing but the best possible attitude prior to her experience, yet she was pinned down and violated by three demonic-like beings in the astral plane. She starts by describing her experience with her spirit guide, named Aaron, who used to make love with her in the astral. One day, the veil was lifted and this spirit guide of hers revealed its true nature. So I called out for Aaron and I thought it was him. Before, whenever I would see Aaron, there was a huge light. This time it was all dark, which should have been an indication, but I ignored it at the time. So it was pleasurable at first. It felt like it started in my base chakra and whatever was touching me was working its way up. I'm not sure when it happened, but all of a sudden it felt like there was an energy change in the room. Aaron or whatever had been with me originally was gone, and now I could sense at least three or more entities. They were standing by me, looking down and discussing what to do with me. One of them said, let's take her back with us. I got a flash of what one looked like and it was not pleasant at all. He had long stick legs, like as skinny as a broom and a head of a ram or something with horns, kind of like that pan creature. The female entity he was talking to had a lot of hate she was directing at me. I was kind of feeling uncomfortable at this point and wanted to leave my body completely to have more control over the situation. It wasn't sleep paralysis, it was like my astral body was being held down. I could move my arms and legs, but I was being pinned down right in the solar plexus area. Then all of a sudden, they started running at me from across the room and darting down on top of me. It's like they were taking turns taking energy. I couldn't really do anything about it, physically or astrally, I was just kind of stuck. Their talking was getting louder, and now I could hear music. It felt very obscene. So the spirit guide showed up with a host of demons, and they pinned down her astral body and all took turns violating her against her will. This debunks the objection that if you're operating at a low vibration of fear, you will manifest or attract scary entities in the astral realm, because this woman called out to her loving spirit guide in confidence and in love. She goes on to say, just thinking about him at any point now, I will get intense butterflies in my stomach and feel like I am in love. So she did not manifest this experience out of fear. She truly believed she had a romantic partnership with her spirit guide, and he turned her over to a host of demons, even though she hadn't been in a prior state of fear. What we learn from this testimony is that fear is not a necessary prerequisite for a bad astral experience. You can have terrifying, evil experiences even if you are in the spirit of love. You don't create your experience with your dominant thought and emotions. 
Another thing about astral entities is they have a reputation of shape-shifting. Because of the graphic nature of this testimony, I will not be quoting it word for word. Even summarizing it is stomach-turning, but it's necessary to communicate the severity of what goes on in the astral realm. He describes being sexually tormented by demons for an hour. This was a frequent occurrence for this person, only this time the demons made him read Bible verses as they were violating him. He believes they were making him do this as a way to mock God. The demons then disguised themselves as a woman and commanded him to violate her. She then shapeshifted into a little girl, and he, being convinced that he was awake at this time, was waiting for the authorities to come take him to prison for child abuse. The first question is, why would these negative astral entities have him read from the Bible as a way to mock God? Why not have him read from the Quran, the Zohar, or the Vedas as a way to mock God? These negative astral entities seem to take issue with the Father of Jesus Christ and not the deities of other religions, which gives credence to the idea that these entities are demonic. This also begs the question, how do we know that the original form they appear to us in isn't already a shape-shifted form? How do we know that their first appearance to us isn't already a disguise? According to the Bible, Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light. His ministry is one of smoke and mirrors. Just because a being manifests himself to us as a guide, a master, a ghost, or an angel doesn't mean this is their actual form. So a second thing we learn about astral projection from this experience is that demons will disguise themselves to hide their actual form. We can't trust the beings we encounter. A forum user describes his experience of being molested by an entity who was pretending to be his girlfriend. Well, this morning I took a nap, and this being posing as my girlfriend tried to get freaky with me. I noticed I was dreaming, and remembered that my girlfriend had school now. It felt different, and that it had attached itself to my root chakra and I was being leeched. I started spewing demon spawn priest talk. I cast the out foul demonic spore of hell. Go back to hell, you spawn of Satan, in my commanding voice and pulled away. It took all of my energy to do that. Then I collapsed on the bed and was paralyzed. I laid there for a while and it all faded away. I woke up again in the astral and this stupid entity was at the doorway, still posing as my girlfriend. I could barely see. My astral vision was blurring, but I could see out of the corner of my eye. Astral sex is a very common practice that is encouraged within the New Age movement, and only God knows how many people are interacting with demons in disguise thinking they are their astral playmates. We learn from this testimony that these demons will manipulate you into having sex with them by changing their form. Another thing they will do, as we have already seen, is paralyze you against your will. A person online reached out for help after having the following experience. I saw myself out of my body, looking around my room, and then something I could feel but not see had come to me. It was a male, and he held me down. I tried to get away, but he was very strong and overpowered me. He put his hands on my throat and I had no voice. He kept me down and took full advantage of me. He was violating me to the fullest extent and left when he was finished. I woke up crying and continued to do so for a while. Another story describes something similar. I drifted into the astral, or was pulled in rather. I floated up to some shifting faces girl. She, or should I say it, opened its mouth really wide and pulled on the side of it. Its skin stretched like elastic and pulled out at about an arm's length. Then it reached at me and tried to do the same on my skin, which wasn't as stretchy. Next thing, something was inserted in my anus. I've had this happen hundreds of times over the last two years. Then, I'm in a new position and arms are paralyzed, so now I can't move. And I start trying really hard to move my arms. I can a little. As I struggle, I hear a woman laughing, as if she were wrestling with me, trying to hold me still. This is the side of astral projection you don't hear about in books or videos. There's lots of instructional material telling people how to leave their bodies, and next to nothing about what actually goes on when people leave their bodies. We learn from these testimonies that you aren't in control. You can be paralyzed and tormented against your will even if you don't want to. Your desires don't affect their behavior. Another common experience is that of astral parasites, where such entities attach themselves to your astral body and feed off of your energy even if you have returned from your OBE. In an article written by a certified hypnotist and metaphysicist of 20 years, he attests to the reality of possession after astral travel. I have had a number of personal experiences with these troublesome creatures. I initially attempted to remove them by taking Epsom salt baths and posting glasses of sea salt around my house. That didn't work. Next, I attempted to send them on their way by burning sage and using a banishing script. I employed this method several times without success. These spirits are incredibly stubborn. I began yelling at them. I told them that I am in charge and that they must vacate the property immediately. One night, I was meditating in a dark room when I suddenly felt a sensation that I would describe as a bug crawling under my left eye. I looked in a mirror and saw that I had a scratch. This was the evil being's way of expressing their displeasure with my behavior. At this point, I realized that parasites had no intention of leaving. His solution? Just ignore them. Fear encourages them. Focus on your life. He hasn't gotten rid of them. We will talk about the real solution to astral horrors later in the video. Here is another account of astral parasites. I've had one experience that convinced me that out-of-body experiences are real, and I had a trippy interesting experience last night which has got me fascinated with the idea of astral projection. Anyhow, if this stuff is real, then I have the impression that I have parasites latched onto me. I've been getting sleep paralysis for years, and I always feel things clinging onto me from behind, and I feel the sensation of needles or something being injected into my spine. It's not very painful, but it feels like whatever is going on there on my back is not good. 
I've tried reaching behind me and grabbing things while I'm in sleep paralysis. It always feels like I'm grabbing some kind of small, three foot tall bony creatures. So we additionally see that demons will attach themselves to you and can enter into you on some level while you are astral traveling. While you are outside of your body, you have fully yielded to a demonic realm and given them legal right into your world by engaging in a sorcery. When you get back into your body, all of a sudden you feel something being attached to you. Demonic oppression is not what people think. It doesn't necessarily make you go insane, speak in demonic voices, or eat spiders. The demon gets woven into some level of your flesh or mind, and its eyes become your eyes. And from this place, it influences your thoughts, your predispositions, and your behaviors. Here's an example of someone experiencing demonic inhabitation after astral projecting. I left my body during astral travel. When I came back, I was not alone. Never been right since then. A guru told me an astral parasite entered my aura. I've tried banishing and purifications, but I think it is still with me. Notice how he didn't say anything about having a terrible astral projection where he saw a bunch of demons. He simply astral projected in the same realm everyone else does, came back, and was not alone in his body anymore. If a practice can open you up to demonic possession, it's demonic. That is what demonic means. Despite the clear evidence of demonic behavior, New Age teachers such as Koi Fresco will often insist that an experience in the astral is neither good nor bad. It just comes down to how we perceive it. Astral projections are not demonic entities or demonic things in their own right. While many religions might try to twist these external experiences beyond the body as such, they are just experiences, and our perception is what shapes them. You can view an astral projection as demonic, or you can view it as angelic. The choice is yours, but on a universal level, it's neither. So beyond My question is, how can we view getting sexually violated against our will by a ram-headed entity as angelic? How is contracting an astral parasite angelic? The New Age movement is absolutely pervaded with signs of demonic activity that most ancient cultures would recognize as such. But because the biggest fear of New Agers is fear itself, they will turn a willful blind eye to the evidence of demonic activity to prevent themselves from seeing the implications of their practices. Pride often prevents a person from seeing that they are involved in something spiritually harmful. It may be embarrassing or discouraging to think that the last year of study and practice for you has been opening up the door to demonic oppression. But even some types of modern Satanism acknowledge the demonic nature of astral projection. On the Joy of Satan Ministries website and other satanic websites, you can learn how to astral project and create your own temple in the astral realm to perform satanic rituals and meet with demons. The Bible calls these experiences demonic. Satanism calls these experiences demonic. Most ancient cultures would call these experiences demonic, and a lot of the New Age movement would agree that these encounters are demonic. They will say, however, that these experiences happen because they were on a lower astral plane. And they were on a lower astral plane because of their low vibrational state. It is said that most experiences can be pleasant, and that all bad experiences are a result of that person being on a lower spiritual plane, and they got to the lower plane by being in a state of fear. This is false because the girl who was raped by her spirit guide was expecting nothing but pure love, like she had previously experienced, and did not say anything about being in a different plane when the demons raped her. None of the testimonies of people who were tormented said anything about being on a different astral plane than before. The idea that demonic activity only happens on some lower astral plane is a textbook ad hoc fallacy. An ad hoc explanation is an explanation that is adopted purely for the purpose of trying to save a theory, without there being any independent reason or rational motivation for it being adopted. If someone gets raped by a demon in the astral, we can save the illusion that the astral plane is a beautiful realm of peace by postulating an infinite number of astral realms and lump all the demonic activity into the lower ones. But this is an unviable explanation when we look at testimonies. Not a single story of astral attacks, astral parasites, or astral rape mentions the person being in a different astral plane. This means that demons inhabit the astral realm regardless of whether or not they have revealed themselves to you yet. If the astral realm is inhabited with demons for some people, that means that it's inhabited with demons in general. They either dwell on the astral plane or they don't. If they dwell there, which evidence shows that they do, then they dwell there even if you have not encountered them yet. Further evidence that this practice is demonic comes from the only thing proven to stop astral attacks from happening. A former UFOlogist discovered that UFO research organizations were covering up testimonies of abductions and spiritual attacks being stopped when they used the name of Jesus and he created a whole website exposing the hidden agenda of these beings. His website contains a hundred testimonies of people who have been able to stop night terrors, astral attacks, alien abductions, and sleep paralysis immediately through nothing more than calling out for Jesus. If these beings were just trickster entities, thought forms, or astral aliens, why would they be subject to people saying his name? Here's one testimony of a woman named Lisa. The first time this happened was last year in April. Whatever it was picked me up by my hair, and when I yelled Jesus Christ, I was released. On the next occasion was right after that, and I was literally being lifted up out of my bed spiritually. I could see my daughter from above, and I said the name again, and it dropped me. The next incident, and this is going to sound very crazy, a wolf was pacing around my bed. He reminded me of the wolf in sheep's clothing. It was very real, just as the other experiences. I experienced in February of this year a long alien-like finger that was stroking my face and tried to drag me out of my bedroom door. Once again, I said the name, and it let me go. When I say drag, it was a spiritually leaving of my body. 
So she was being pulled out of her body spiritually by something that tried dragging her out of her bedroom, and this experience was interrupted by using the name of Jesus. If these astral beings aren't demons, why do they yield to the name of Jesus? The Bible says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. If Jesus is God over all, as it says in Romans, it makes perfect sense why the name of Jesus would stop these astral attacks. But if Jesus is nobody special and these were just general astral creatures, why is Jesus a problem for them? Remember, it was the God of the Bible the astral demons were trying to mock in the previous testimony we read, not the gods of Hinduism. A man named Jason gives a similar testimony. I was asleep in my basement bedroom when I woke up suddenly and noticed three beings standing at the foot of the bed. I was completely paralyzed and overcome with terror, and immediately sensed these beings were evil. They had reptilian skin and large black eyes. They floated around to the side of the bed. I sensed that the one in the middle was their leader. The leader reached down and grabbed my arms with his hands on my biceps and lifted me out of bed. I felt almost completely weightless like a helium balloon. When I was in a standing position, but not touching the floor, his mouth opened wide and he breathed the furnace hot blast of sulfur smelling air in my face. Then we began to rotate and sink head first in the floor. I thought they were taking me to hell, and I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And instantly I was back in bed. My heart was pounding out of my chest and I was soaked with sweat. From these testimonies, we additionally learned that astral attacks are interrupted by calling out to Jesus, which confirms to us their identity as demons and his identity as Lord. Demons want you to astral project so that they can make you think you are your own god, and can instill false doctrines of ascension into you, convincing you that you can spiritually evolve through secret knowledge and performing occult practices. It's also leveraged to instill false theories of the afterlife into you, causing you to think you can just float around in the astral until you decide to reincarnate again. New Agers believe that you experience a good or bad astral realm temporarily, depending on whether you are a good or bad person in this life, and that the bad astral experience after death only lasts until you forgive yourself. Not only does this contradict everything Jesus says about the afterlife, it contradicts every other culture in history. If your astral projection experiences make you think you are a god, that the astral realm is a benevolent floaty realm, or that you won't have to be morally accountable in the afterlife, then you are being systematically groomed by the same demons that torment people on the astral plane. And this is actually testable, as we have seen from the testimonies where astral entities run for the hills at the name of Christ. For the people of these testimonies, the veil of delusion has been lifted from their eyes, and they see the astral realm and the beings that inhabit it for what they truly are, demons who are subject to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We have learned that the Bible condemns the practice of astral projection as sorcery, as sin worthy of God's judgment. We have learned that the Bible identifies higher spiritual realms as being the air and the heavenly places in which Satan and his demons operate. We have also learned the following six facts about astral projection. It's a dangerous occult practice that does nothing except make you susceptible to demonic influence and deceive you about the nature of the soul, the spirit world, and the afterlife. God prohibits such practices in scripture because he knows what we are getting involved with. He knows what's on the other side of the veil if we try to leave our body, and he knows we will be deceived if we go down that rabbit hole. Psychedelic drugs are a class of substances that interact with the serotonin receptors in the brain, causing an alteration in perception, and sometimes resulting in visionary or hallucinatory experiences. The most commonly used psychedelic drugs are LSD, DMT, mescaline, and psilocybin mushrooms. While the use of these drugs may seem a little taboo in our society, these substances are glorified in spiritual movements such as shamanism or the New Age movement, and they are advertised as being gateways to supernatural realities and catalysts for metaphysical insight. They have been used for such purposes for thousands of years. Since coming out of the New Age movement, one of the most common questions I have received is what does the Bible say about psychedelics? Is it a sin to use them? As someone who has had some experiences with psilocybin mushrooms, has seen documentaries explaining the spiritual benefits of these substances, and used to watch Terence McKenna videos frequently and read his work, The Food of the Gods, I do bring a little bit of experience and background understanding to this video. In this video, we're going to focus on how the use of psychedelics is condemned in the Bible, and how we are to understand them in light of Christ. All of the scripture and arguments we are going to look at also apply to the use of other drugs such as marijuana, meth, or cocaine. We should start off by establishing that the meaning of life is fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, not expanding our perspectives, being in contact with the spirit world, or fulfilling human curiosity. The end of human life is to be restored to relationship with the Father through faith in Jesus. It all comes down to salvation available in Christ alone, which by itself is the entire purpose of our life here. If it is not bringing you to your knees at the feet of the Savior in conviction over your sin and his lordship, it won't matter in the end because eternity lies on the other side of the veil. And when we stand before God, we are either covered by the blood of Jesus or we are guilty under the weight of our sin. Biblically speaking, the shifting of our consciousness with drugs is not something God calls us to do. It does not bring us closer to him. And as we are about to see, it is something that directly conflicts with the commands given in scripture. Now the Bible actually prohibits the use of drugs under the word sorcery. In Galatians 5 it reads, Now the works of the flesh are evident, 
sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, etc. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here it says that those who partake in sorcery will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Greek word used here is actually pharmakia, which is where we derive the word pharmacy from. While it's true that this word means magic and witchcraft, it also means magic with drugs, or simply, the use of drugs. The use of drugs, especially of purgatives. Generally, the use of any kind of drugs. The use of magic often involving drugs, and the casting of spells upon people. In its general sense, practice of drugging. The use of drugs, sorcery. The preparing or using of medicine. Then, the using of any kind of drugs, potions, or spells. The use of medicine, drugs, or spells. The use or administering of drugs. Psychedelics fit this definition perfectly. Now, since we know the Bible does not prohibit the use of medicine, as even Luke, the author of Luke's Gospel and Acts, was a practicing physician, we can conclude that this word includes drugs used for recreational, spiritual, or ceremonial purposes. Potential extra-biblical support for the word pharmakia being the use of drugs, and even perhaps psychedelics in particular, comes from the Book of Enoch. While the Book of Enoch is not God-breathed like scripture is, that doesn't mean it doesn't contain any truth. After all, Jude quoted from the Book of Enoch directly, meaning at least some of it is true. Now this is not the word of God, it's not scripture, but it does give us insight into potential truth, as well as a historical understanding of how the Jews and early Christians may have understood the use of such substances. When describing the fall of angels and the knowledge they taught to mankind to pervert the human race, it reads, And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one, and then began to go in unto them and defiled themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots and made them acquainted with the plants. The Hebrew word used for charms is kishaf, meaning sorcery and or witchcraft. In the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the word used here is pharmakia. Notice here how kishaf, pharmakia, the cutting of roots, and the knowledge of plants are being taught alongside one another, as if they are all a part of the same office. Again, in chapter 8, we see that one fallen angel named Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Why did the fallen angels insist on teaching mankind how to cut roots and make them acquainted with the plants? Since Adam already knew everything there was to know about gardening before the fall, man was already acquainted with the plants in the context of horticulture. So this is not a fallen angel trying to teach humanity how to be better gardeners. While this may refer to roots being used in spellcasting, a possible explanation for this reference is that the fallen angels taught mankind how to identify and utilize the psychedelic compounds found within the root systems of plants in order to trigger visionary experiences. Some roots, such as the iboga root, have been cultivated and used by shamans in mixtures and brews for thousands of years because they contain psychedelic compounds that, when extracted and consumed, give people supernatural metaphysical experiences. Here is a list of over 20 plants with psychedelic compounds in their roots. This would explain the reference to root cutting and being made acquainted with the plants, and why it is taught alongside enchantments and pharmakia. Looking at all this, someone might say, Pharmakia in Galatians and Enoch is not referring to drugs, but to spellcasting. Sure, the word can mean the use of drugs, but that's not what the Holy Spirit had in mind in Galatians and in other parts of the Bible. If transpersonal mystical experiences coming alongside the use of drugs cannot be called pharmakia, I don't know what can. This is literally what the word means in its primary usages. But even if we turn a blind eye to the definition of pharmakia and say this means performing witchcraft only, here are four other ways that God condemns the use of such substances in Scripture. The use of psychedelics falls under the same category as drunkenness. The Bible says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. As we already read in Galatians, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these, I warn you, as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. The word used here for drunkenness is methe, and it primarily refers to intoxication by alcohol. However, it is not limited to this and also includes intoxication by other substances. According to the New Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, methe means an intoxicant, intoxication, drunkenness. So the Greek word here refers to any kind of intoxicant. We are not to be drunk with wine or any substance. This is what methe means. And the word drunk means relating to, caused by, or characterized by intoxication, pertaining to, or caused by intoxication or intoxicated persons. So even the English word drunkenness does not refer to alcohol alone, but to any kind of intoxication. And intoxicate means to excite or stupefy by alcohol or a drug, especially to the point where physical and mental control is markedly diminished. So the word drunkenness doesn't just refer to alcohol, and the word methe doesn't just refer to alcohol. 
It's the Greek word used to indicate any kind of intoxicant. So if the Bible says that intoxication is a serious sin that will exclude someone from the kingdom of heaven, and the very way psychedelics function is to intoxicate one's brain and bloodstream with psychoactive chemicals, then using them is a sin that transgresses God's commandment to refrain from methe, from drunkenness, which again does not refer to alcohol only, but to any kind of intoxication by drugs. Another point is that we are directly commanded to be sober. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. As for you, always be sober-minded. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The Greek word used here is nepho, which means to be temperate, self-controlled, and abstinent. These are direct commands in scripture for us to be sober, especially in our minds and in our thinking. And we can't be sober in our minds and in our thinking if we are intoxicated under chemically induced states of consciousness. A fourth way the Bible prohibits the use of psychedelics is that we are called to come separate from the secular and pagan world. God wants us to live in a way that is pure and distinct from the ways of this world. What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned in Christ. We are commanded to cease from the actions that the world partakes in and to live a life that is set apart for God. This is why God gave commandments in the Old Testament to the Jews, telling them how to dress, how to wear their hair, and not to make markings on their skin. It says in Leviticus, they shall not make bald patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. Other cultures would do these things as part of their religious practices, and God didn't want his people to be associated with the idolatrous ways of the pagan nations. From the very beginning, God commanded his people to have nothing to do with the spiritual practices of the surrounding nations. God wants a people for himself that is virginal, pure, and conformed to the image of his son. He wants us to look different, think different, and act different. And historically speaking, the only cultures who used these substances were pagan. Siberia, ancient Egypt, Asia, Colombia, Brazil, Ecuador, China, ancient Greece, India, Peru, Maya, and other Mesoamerican cultures, Native America, all these cultures have been using psychoactive drugs for thousands of years for spiritual, recreational, and ceremonial purposes. God is telling us to come out from the way these cultures think and act, especially in regards to their spirituality. Biblically speaking, the only historical precedence we have for the use of psychedelic drugs comes from the pagan nations that God commands that we be distinct from. And a fifth point we're going to look at is that we are called to obey the laws of the land. God wants us to live lives that are above reproach and in accordance with the laws that the government has put in place. In so doing, we glorify God and keep our conscience clean. So let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Speaking to Titus, Paul says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. It dishonors God when we live our lives in a way that makes us blamable under the law. And so using drugs transgresses God's commandment to live lawful, obedient lives. Obviously, if the law commands we do things that contradict his commandments, then we are to obey God instead. But apart from laws demanding that we sin against God, we are to follow the laws of the land. And for the vast majority of the people watching, these drugs are illegal in their country and state. And for those who want to say, well, these drugs are illegal in my country and state, all the other points we looked at would still apply. We can clearly see the Bible communicates a variety of different principles that put the use of psychedelics in a class of very serious sin, going as far as to say that drunkenness, or methe, intoxication, and sorcery, pharmakia, the use of drugs, will exempt the person from the kingdom of God. 
it causes us to be intoxicated in our bodies and minds, it conforms us to the pattern of the pagan and secular world around us, and it is against the law which God commands that we follow in order to honor him. And so we need to turn away from our sins, put away the use of these substances, put our faith in Jesus for our salvation, and follow the straight and narrow path that leads to everlasting life. Expect depression, expect suicidal thoughts. Expect sometimes to have waves of insanity and madness. You might feel like you're losing your mind, and you actually have this weird energy moving through you, and you start to behave as though your body is being controlled by a puppet master. Your body is just moving on its own, and you have no idea what the hell is controlling you. It's almost like you've been possessed. Hey guys, Steve here. In this video, we're going to talk about meditation in a way you've probably never heard it spoken about before. Is it possible that we are being deceived about meditation? Is it possible that there's a dangerous, more sinister reality behind meditation that is being deliberately swept under the rug? And what if clinical research actually proves that meditation is psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually dangerous? To some people, this may sound like a typical Christian paranoia, especially coming from an ex-New Ager, such as myself. I couldn't have imagined making a video like this, say, five years ago, when I was writing articles on the benefits of meditation on one of the largest New Age websites in the world, or when I was practicing meditation, or when I was writing my ebook on mindfulness that got 30,000 downloads. I really thought that meditation was a necessary part of life, and if anyone were to tell me it was dangerous, I would think that they're unscientific or completely crazy. After all, all we ever hear about is how meditation can improve sleep, how it can reduce stress, how it can improve creativity. But the truth is, there's a massive body of research that clearly demonstrates and proves that meditation has the ability to cause long-term and short-term psychological damage. The only reason we hear about the good effects of meditation is because oftentimes only the good effects are reported on. Over 75% of meditation studies that are performed don't ask participants to report any negative effects they experience. But when subjects are asked to report negative effects, or when they're tested specifically for negative effects, the results are beyond disturbing. Now there are many different meditation techniques such as Vipassana meditation, which focuses on the interconnection between mind and body through focused breathing and physical sensations, or Transcendental meditation, which uses the repetition of a mantra to induce a trance-like state, to any kind of general mindfulness or insight meditation. But the following dangers apply to all techniques, we know this because the studies we are about to look at include reports from each of these methods. And what makes this conversation relevant right now is that this practice is continuing to become more and more popular in our society. It's currently a $1.2 billion industry that is still growing, and studies show it's being practiced by about 40% of Americans. It's being recommended by doctors, it's being recommended by therapists, it's being integrated into children's public schools, Catholic schools, prisons, and even the workplace. It's being promoted by some very influential people right now, such as Oprah Winfrey, Jim Carrey, Ellen DeGeneres, and even presidential candidate Marianne Williamson. This is an absolute staple practice in Eastern religions and in the New Age movement. And now it's beginning to be a staple in mainstream culture. So what we're going to do is allow the studies to speak for themselves and reveal to us the shocking truth about meditation that never gets spoken of. So let's get into it. The best place to start in this discussion is by looking at a new study published in 2017 on the negative effects of meditation, led by Dr. Willoughby Britton, professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University. The study sought to determine and document what kind of negative side effects regular meditators experienced during their practice. The study also sought to document how severe, how frequent, and how long-lasting these negative side effects were. Sixty people were selected to participate in this study, each of whom had meditation experience in Theravada, Zen, and Tibetan Buddhist traditions. They also had to be exempt of any kind of unusual psychological experiences in their past that could mimic the symptoms they may report during meditation. What is interesting about this study is just how long these sixty participants had been meditating for. It's sometimes asserted that if people had bad experiences during meditation, or any practice embraced by the New Age for that matter, it's because they're inexperienced and don't know what they're doing. They're just being uncareful and lack the proper training. But in this study, 43% of the participants they interviewed had meditated for 10,000 hours or more, while another 49% meditated between 1,000 hours and 10,000 hours. Not only this, but 60% of the participants were meditation teachers. These people were literal experts. These were also educated people, as only two lacked college degrees and 67% of them had a master's degree or higher. And what they were interviewed for was challenging, difficult, or distressing experiences they experienced during meditation. So here's a breakdown of what their findings were, and keep in mind these are experts who have training in Buddhist and Zen meditation traditions and have meditated for more hours than probably anybody watching this video right now. Through in-person and phone interview, the study found that 82% of participants reported fear, anxiety, panic, and paranoia. 57% reported depression, dysphoria, or grief. 50% reported social impairment. 47% reported delusional, irrational, or paranormal beliefs. 47% reported physical pain. 42% reported occupational impairment. 30% reported rage, anger, or aggression. 27% reported sleep disorders. 25% reported self-conscious emotions and insecurity. 23% reported agitation 
agitation and irritability. 22% reported headaches or head pressure. 20% reported fatigue or weakness. 18% reported suicidality. 17% reported emotional detachment. And 17% said that they experienced something so severe that it required inpatient hospitalization. Now, a skeptic may say, well, sure, these kinds of things arise when you've never really been meditating before, and these things will work themselves out over time. But only 18% of these challenges occurred during the first 50 hours of meditation. 29% of reported challenges were within the first year, and 45% of the participants reported challenges in years 1 to 10. So most of these side effects actually came about with regular long-term meditation. The study actually found that the more someone studies and practices meditation, the worse their experience will actually be. Now, a skeptic may also say, well, sure, but these experiences just kind of rise and dissipate in consciousness in a matter of minutes. It's nothing to really alarm ourselves over. It's just the growing pains of ego death. The problem with this objection is that 88% said that these impacts bled over into daily life even after the retreat or meditation session was over. 73% reported moderate to severe impairment because of one or more of these symptoms, and these symptoms were reported to last anywhere from one week to over a decade. But here's the important stat. Most of these side effects lasted one to six months or one to three years. These two spans of time represent the most common duration of negative symptoms reported by the meditators. It's not enough to simply write these off as small hiccups along the path to inner peace. Most people reported these symptoms lasting months to years, and these regular long-term side effects seem to be more congruent with psychological breakdowns and disorders than with enlightenment. As the study itself notes, many of the experiences reported by practitioners in our study resemble, to varying degrees, phenomena discussed in the vast literature on schizophrenia, schizotypy, psychosis, as well as non-psychopathological forms of anomalous experience. In an interview with Yoga Journal, Dr. Britton, who conducted this study, was asked when she began to take interest in studying these darker truths about meditation. In 2006, when I was doing my residency, I worked at an inpatient psychiatric hospital, and there were two people who were hospitalized after a 10-day retreat at a meditation center nearby. It reminded me that meditation can be serious, and that someone should study that side of it. When asked why she thinks these case studies and clinical findings don't get any press, she said, quote, Mindfulness is a multi-billion dollar industry. One of the teachers I interviewed for my research actually said, this isn't good for advertising. In other words, there is a deliberate attempt to suppress the dark reality of meditation because of how profitable the industry is. A lot of people knock the Christian church because they think it's just a money-making machine, and they go to the New Age movement instead, not realizing the suppression of information and greed that lies at the heart of all its apparently altruistic aspirations. Now, Britain's study is the largest study in history on the adverse effects of meditation, but it's by no means the only one. A 1992 study by Dave Shapiro, a professor at the University of California, took a sample of 27 long-term meditators and found that 63% of the group studied had suffered at least one negative effect for meditation and meditation retreats, while 7.4% reported profoundly adverse effects including panic, depression, pain, and anxiety to such a degree that they had to stop meditation. One person was even hospitalized with psychosis. But these findings go back even earlier, when psychologist Dr. Arnold Lazarus found that meditation can lead to depression, agitation, and schizophrenic relapses back in the 70s. Another study from 2018 found that meditation can actually worsen traumatic distress in people. Trauma survivors can experience flashbacks, disassociation, and even re-traumatization. And other studies have validated this finding that, quote, meditation has the potential to re-traumatize people with a history of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's also been linked to depersonalization and derealization. And another study found it exasperated depression to the point of attempted suicide. Here are a few clinical case studies of the specific experiences of people that were published in peer-reviewed journals. For these people, meditation was linked with psychosis and loss of touch with reality. A case study in 2001 looked at two manic episodes that both emerged after a meditation session. Three case reports linked meditation to the reliving of traumatic memories and events. And three case reports also linked meditation to psychotic episodes in people with a history of schizophrenia. A news media outlet called The Guardian highlights two real-life examples of meditation gone wrong, which sound identical to what these case studies have been finding. Claire, a 37-year-old, was sent on a three-day mindfulness course with colleagues as part of a training program. Initially, I found it relaxing, she says, but then I found I completely zoned out while doing it. Within two or three hours of sessions later, I was starting to really, really panic. The sessions resurfaced memories of her traumatic childhood, and she experienced a series of panic attacks. Somehow, the course triggered things I had previously got over, Claire says. I had a breakdown and spent three months in a psychiatric unit. It was a depressive breakdown with psychotic elements related to the trauma and several disassociative episodes. Four and a half years later, Claire is still working part-time and is in and out of the hospital. She became addicted to alcohol when previously she had been driven and high-performing and believes mindfulness was the catalyst for her breakdown. Luis, a woman in her 50s who had been practicing yoga for 20 years, went away to a meditation retreat. While meditating, she felt disassociated from herself and became worried. Dismissing it as a routine side effect of meditation, Luis continued with the exercises. 
The following day, after returning home, her body felt completely numb and she didn't want to get out of bed. Her husband took her to the doctor who referred her to a psychiatrist. For the next 15 years, she was treated with psychotic depression. Even my own girlfriend went on a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat before she got saved, and she said that she felt confused, emotionally detached, that it impaired her relationship to other people, and she said it felt like she was on a self-induced acid trip. Now, we could go on and on with these studies, but the evidence is clear. Meditation, whether practiced by an expert or beginner, has the potential to cause short-term and long-term psychological damage. But the funny thing is, even meditation teachers themselves recognize this. Here is a mindfulness teacher named Leo, who runs one of the biggest self-help and personal development YouTube channels online. His channel, Actualize.org, has almost 1 million subscribers. Here is a video he made called The Dark Side of Meditation, teaching some of the things people can expect from their meditation practice. Meditation is not all rainbows and butterflies. Some of the stuff that comes up is freaky, weird, downright alien, expect depression and meaninglessness. Uh, I can almost guarantee that if you're going to meditate for longer than a year, that you will be hit by some serious spells of depression. Also expect suicidal thoughts. I can almost guarantee that if you are meditating effectively, you will have more suicidal thoughts than you've probably ever had in your life. The more I meditate, the more suicidal thoughts I have. And that's totally fine. You might turn back to old habits that you've worked through already. You might go start doing drugs again, or alcohol, or smoking cigarettes, even though you haven't done that for years. You might go on a sex binge and go sleep with a bunch of random strangers on one night stands. Expect old repressed memories to come bubbling up. It's gonna be some traumatic stuff, especially if you had traumas in your childhood. Stuff that you've repressed, maybe examples like abuse, sexual abuse, bullying, humiliation, that will come bubbling up. Expect sometimes to have waves of insanity and madness wash over you, where you just feel like your mind is like a swarming hive of bees. And the more you try to control it, the more out of control it gets. This is all quite common stuff. This is stuff that you should definitely expect. Don't be surprised at all if it happens to you. And not just once, but repeatedly. In fact, what you should start noticing is that it's a recurrent theme throughout long-term meditation, is that this stuff starts coming up. So here's a question. How could it be the case that meditating could give rise to so many negative experiences? How can something like sitting or focusing on your breathing or trying to develop a new relationship to your mind result in something like hospitalization for psychotic depression? I think there's a few psychological reasons we should start with, and the first is this. Meditation causes us to tap into deeper layers of our psyche where trauma has been filed away. Our brain is designed by God to increase our chances of well-being and survival in the next moment. It's not designed to put life on hold the minute there is discomfort or trauma. It's meant to help you cope with surviving the next moment in spite of that trauma. For example, if something traumatic like a divorce happens, our psychology is not designed to sort out every ounce of pain and every negative thought before moving forward. Imagine if our brain required us to be 100% trauma-free before we could accomplish the task in front of us that day. We would get absolutely nowhere in life. And so our mind will naturally file some of this away to ensure we can still function. And in so doing, it suppresses traumatic memories and represses traumatic feelings in deeper psycho-emotional containers. A lot of people turn to meditation precisely because they are experiencing stress, anxiety, or depression. People attempt to use it as a way to pacify negative emotions. But by attempting to bypass the surface levels of their own mind, they are accessing deeper reservoirs in their psychology where trauma has been filed. And all of these anxieties and traumas from the past begin to surface as a result. To try to bypass ordinary consciousness is to tap into deep repositories of the psyche that have been designed by God to store and process trauma. And the result could be, as we have seen, long-term psychological damage and the resurfacing of traumatic memories and events. Now, I fully believe God wants us to deal and work through the trauma that has been buried in us from our past. He wants to redeem these wounds and these memories and heal us emotionally. Claire, for example, the woman who had traumatic memories resurfaced, ended up in a really bad place, not because of her past, but because of how her past manifested when it wasn't supposed to. If we are struggling with things from our past that are still affecting us, God doesn't want us burying it. God wants us to be resourceful in our healing and create the right set and setting for that healing going to a qualified Christian counselor, having a loving support system of friends and family, being a part of a local body of believers who can pray with you and support you, and spending time in the Word of God, having your mind renewed, growing in the power and the presence of God. God wants us dealing with these things, but meditation is an attempt to hack a system that is not meant to be hacked, and as we have seen, it causes things to emerge in ways and at times that are psychologically damaging. Another psychological danger is that meditation causes you to fundamentally alter the structure of your own mind. Eastern and New Age philosophy tells us that there is something essentially wrong with how human psychology is designed. We are designed to live from a personal sense of self as our only experience of the world, which we are told is a problem, and we are designed to naturally identify with the ego mind, which we are told is a problem. There is a structural error in how the self and the mind is built. 
resulting in most of our suffering. Therefore, we are told we need to dissolve or detach from the ego and disidentify from the personal sense of self-identity to reach a state of enlightenment and liberation. We don't need to simply input new data into the mind, but to change the very software and structure of the mind at a root level. The Bible, however, tells us that our psychological templates are perfect. Our problem is not that we live as an ego or that we live from a limited personal sense of self. Our problem is that we have a fallen nature and live in rebellion to God. But meditation traditions identify the problem as being the actual structure of our psychology, and therefore we must put mindfulness into practice as an attempt to fix our own psychological framework. The problem is not a fallen nature and a wicked heart. The problem is the very design of the mind and of the self. But who wrote the rule that said the self is something we need to transcend? Who said that the ego is something we need to dissolve? And who said that trying to do either of these things is psychologically safe? What if the Bible is right when it says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made but just fallen, and that these parts of our psychology were designed by God to facilitate a very important purpose? What if we could be dangerously tampering with God's design for the human mind by trying to dissolve or transcend anything? There is a reason why God said man was created good in the garden. Not because we're good in our actions, we're fallen but because we're good by design. Major problems can occur when you try to manipulate the structure of your own psychology. And I think a lot of these symptoms, such as depersonalization, confusion, manic episodes, psychosis, loss of sense of self, irrational thinking, and schizophrenic-like symptoms are the result of trying to tinker with God's design for the human ego, for the human mind, and for the personal self. We end up alienating ourselves from a proper relationship to our own thoughts and feelings resulting in chaos. As psychologist D.A. Trelevin says, there is a disconnection between thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations that is exacerbated by contemplative practice. And I also think it's possible that meditation in some cases can open us up to demonic oppression. The meditation study done by Willoughby Britton also found that 42% of participants experienced hallucinations, visions, or illusions. 37% experienced involuntary movements. 33% reported seeing visual lights, and 18% experienced seeing physical objects dissolve. Now, while some of these experiences may be psychosomatic, it's known within all spiritual traditions, especially Christianity, that things like visions and involuntary movements can be induced by dark supernatural forces. A study was published on meditation-induced light experiences, documenting in clinical research and in Buddhist traditions that meditators experience visions and hallucinations, such as seeing waves of smoke, orbs, jewels in the sky, ropes appearing out of objects, or light emanating from their own bodies. Another study linked meditation to the occurrence of out-of-body experiences, an experience which is intrinsically demonic as proven further in a video I did on astral projection. It's common knowledge that meditation leads to an increased occurrence of nightmares and sleep paralysis, which can be demonically inspired at times. And as we have already seen, meditation is linked to suicidal tendencies and all kinds of mental health problems, such as delusions, paranoia, and psychosis, which may have spiritual orientation as well, since the Bible will sometimes correlate these symptoms to demonic oppression. For example, in Mark 5.15, a demon-possessed man cutting himself was only found to be, quote, in his right mind once demons were expelled from him. Meditation causes paranoia, confusion, disorientation, etc., which the Bible tells us can come from demons. Oddly enough, it's common knowledge that things can go spiritually sideways during meditation. Listen to what Leo from Actualize.org says can happen. Expect nightmares. Expect weird dreams, where in your dreams you're living out weird fantasies like having sex with your mother or, uh, you know, killing people, or the, the, you know, butchering your dog with a cleaver, or something like that. Like, you know, you might start to behave like an animal. Like, literally, you might start to scratch yourself like an animal, or crawl around on your knees, or even howl, howling like a wolf. Oh! Also, expect paranormal phenomena to happen to you. Having past live experiences or seeing the future. Having full out-of-body experiences where you actually leave your body and you travel to some sort of astral realm and interact with various kinds of entities. You might see spirits or hear spirits. You might hear weird voices in your head. You might actually see angels and demons. Again, not imagined, but like standing before you. You might see gods, deities, giant crawling insects, praying mantis people, spirit animals that talk to you, try to tell you things, or maybe that try to kill you. You might see entities, you might see aliens, you might feel like you're being channeled by some sort of extraterrestrial, or that you're getting abducted or probed. You might also experience a kundalini awakening, which can be a freaky thing. It might feel like you're losing your mind, and you actually have this weird energy moving through you, and you start to behave as though your body is being controlled by a puppet master. Like, you're not even in control of your body anymore. Your body is just moving on its own, and you have no idea what the hell is controlling you. It's almost like you've been possessed. This is demonic by any and all standards. 
and all it takes is a quick Google search to see that people struggle with demonic attacks after meditation and are looking for help on public forums. And because it opens up doorways to the demonic, meditation is actually something taught in spiritual Satanism to facilitate demonic encounters. On the Joy of Satan ministry site, for example, there are scores of different meditations listed for spiritual power and growth, the exact same ones taught in the New Age movement, some of which involve invoking the energies of demons or of Satan himself. Another satanic ministry tells us that you can use meditation to get to know demons better. Now, if meditation was a safe and purely physical exercise, it would not result in demonic encounters and it would not be taught by spiritual Satanists to facilitate demonic encounters. The problem is meditation is an intrinsically spiritual practice. For thousands of years, meditation has been used to facilitate and develop a certain spiritual estate, such as nirvana, or a certain kind of spiritual insight, such as moksha. In Hinduism, for example, meditation is believed to result in what are called siddhis, which are supernatural abilities which include the ability to teleport at will, to leave your body and enter the body of another person, to mind read, to control the weather, to see into the future, to see into the pastimes of the gods, and to die when one desires to die. Now the Bible is super clear that things like this are the abilities or deceptions brought about by demons, such as in Acts 16:16, 16, 16, where a demonic spirit gave a woman the ability to predict the future. If meditation traditions tell us that side effects of the practice mirror what the Bible attributes to demonic power, that should be a red flag to us. And what we are doing in the West is taking something that is an intrinsically spiritual practice, we're trying to strip it of its spiritual purpose, and then we wonder why the practice is going sideways. So here's a question, how is it the case that meditation, something like sitting still and trying to develop a new relationship to your thoughts, how can something like that result in demonic oppression? I think the first is that we are making ourselves a spiritual open house to the spirit world by relaxing what the Bible says is one of our primary defense systems, the mind. The Bible is extremely clear that one of the ways we protect ourselves spiritually is by exercising our minds correctly. We are told to take every thought captive, to be vigilant and sober-minded, to not follow after the stranger's voice. We are told to test the spirits and to guard our hearts. All of these commands are a call for us to exercise our thinking correctly, not empty our thoughts. It's a call to be on guard by protecting our mind against thoughts that go against the will and word of God. We need to use our mind to access the weapons of our warfare. The Bible tells us that the weapons of our spiritual warfare are our helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. To use the spiritual weaponry God gave us is to fight down wrong thoughts with right ones and to expel lies with truth. God tells us in 1 Peter 1.13 to quote, prepare our minds for action. This is actually what biblical quote meditation is. Biblical meditation is about filling your mind with the word of God. Over 20 times in the Bible, the word meditation is used. In the Hebrew, the word is sinuhet, which means to consider, to be concerned with, and to muse. Now to muse literally means to quote, be absorbed in thought. So when the Bible talks about meditation, it's referring to being in a state of ponderance, being in a state of deep reflection. For example, David talks about meditating on the law, the precepts, and the statutes of God, the works of God, the promises of God, the deeds of God. So God tells us to fill our minds with the truth. Meditation tells us to do the exact opposite, to empty our minds. And by emptying our minds, we are setting our spiritual weaponry aside. Rather than actually engaging and acting our defense systems, meditation trains us to allow thoughts to just pass in, and we're not to judge them, we're not to react to them. Ram Dass even talks about loving his thoughts, by allowing thoughts of murder into our minds, by permitting thoughts of murder and rage into our minds, the Bible says we can attract spirits of murder and rage to ourselves, because to be thinking that way is a sin. And what's worse is that some of our thoughts aren't really our thoughts, they're demonic projections and thought forms being infused and projected into our minds. Thoughts begin to be projected into our defenseless minds by outside forces, influencing our thoughts and desires. Additionally, our own sinful thoughts go unchecked and can attract the wrong spirits to us. There's literally no way to protect yourself when you're in a state like that. You have made yourself a spiritual open house, and the next thing you know, you are suicidal, paranoid, hallucinating, seeing demons or aliens, or wanting to howl like a wolf, like Leo says. Now, another way meditation opens us up to demonic is that meditation qualifies as being the sin of psychological magic, psychological witchcraft. Aleister Crowley, a famous 20th century occultist who had a major role in popularizing Eastern practice and philosophy in the West, defined magic as being, quote, the science and art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. It is theoretically possible to cause in any object any change of which that object is capable by nature. Crowley believed that by tapping into our will and marrying that with intention, we could access the primordial flow of energy in the universe and produce change in any eligible structure in the natural world. 
This was his definition of occult magic. And notice how this definition doesn't require there to be a supernatural force involved. For example, attempting to use the power of the mind and will to bend a spoon, implant a thought into someone telepathically, or make an object levitate would be examples of the sin of magic that have nothing to do with calling on a supernatural force or being. If you were using the power of your mind to attempt to alter the structure of something, producing an effect that goes against its natural design or ability, you are engaged in magic. Remember what we talked about earlier in the video, how meditation seeks to change the structure of the mind itself. The kinds of things people seek to accomplish with the practice of meditation include transcending the personal self and dissolving the personal ego. We're using our will and our intention to change not the content of our mind, but the very structure of our God-given and God-designed mind. There is a way God designed the mind, and meditation tries to cause a change at the structural level, just like someone may try to use their will to change the molecular structure of a spoon at a structural level to produce an effect. If I'm using my will and my intention to try and dissolve a layer of my psychology known as the ego, I am just as much practicing magic by Crowley's own definition as if I were to try to attempt to levitate a physical object. Whether I'm attempting to bend or dissolve a spoon with my will or bend or dissolve my mind, myself, or the ego, I am tampering with God's design of nature in a way that I shouldn't be and I'm involved in a practice of psychological magic which is a sin, which is an open door for demons to oppress me. This would fall under the category of sorcery in Galatians 5.20 or magic arts in Revelation 21.8. This is something that puts us outside of the protective covering of the Father and gives demons right of way to oppress us in ways that we've already documented and seen evidence for in this video. Now before we close, one more notable danger of meditation is that it promotes deception. When we are in an altered state of consciousness and when our brainwave state has been fundamentally changed, we are more likely to believe things about the world and about ourselves that we normally wouldn't believe. For example, if you alter your consciousness with psilocybin, heroin, or acid, you are going to be self-deceived about your own experience and may end up believing things that contradict the truth. You may end up believing that you are God, that the trees are God, or that you have lived many past lives. Likewise, altering your consciousness and brainwaves through meditation causes you to become prone to deceptions at a psychological level, but also because of any supernatural influence that may be at work in your practice. Through this altered state, perhaps you too will end up believing that you are God, the trees are God, and that you have lived many past lives, which is what every New Age and Eastern tradition actually adheres to. Reincarnation and pantheism are staples in the New Age and Eastern spiritual philosophy. And what's interesting is that the major study we looked at earlier done by Dr. Britton found that 48% of meditators experienced changes in their worldviews. Those who meditate often tend to adopt the same core spiritual beliefs. And this is another danger of meditation because it makes us prone to deception. I believe this is partly because of the alteration of consciousness and partly because of the oppressive principality over this practice, projecting false thoughts and impressions into people that seem to validate what they are naturally predisposed to while being in this altered state. So as we have seen, meditation has been proven to be clinically dangerous psychologically and emotionally, short term and long term, whether pertaining to novice or expert meditators. We have also seen that meditation can result in certain experiences and side effects that are best explained by inferring demonic oppression. This is not something God wants us doing and this is not God's path to peace. God's path to peace is righteousness, listening to our consciences, living responsibly, living for an eternal purpose with God's redemptive plan in mind, guarding our hearts and our minds with the truth, forgiving and blessing our enemies, believing what God says about our identity and his love for us, and most importantly, being in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, through repenting of our sins and believing the gospel. We're going to look at the topic of crystals as they're used in the New Age movement, and we're going to look at two primary ways we can understand the use of crystals in light of scripture. In the New Age movement, crystals are believed to be metaphysical healing tools that have the ability to raise your vibration, improve your mood, and cleanse the energy fields of your body. What they mean is that at an energetic level, crystals emit their own energetic signature. They have a certain tune to them, a certain resonance or frequency to them. One crystal might have the frequency of inspiration, another might have one of courage or of love. And so when you carry these crystals around with you and use them, in healing or in therapy, their energy rubs off onto you and into your energy field, transferring their energetic properties over to you. In the New Age movement, they're also believed to be healing wands where you can bring through your own intention and your own energies or the energies of spirit guides or ascended masters or aliens or archangels through the crystal as a sort of wand where it then becomes a transmitter for energy to pass through you into a subject. Healing crystals harness the life-giving elements of the earth and the universe. Harnessing the energy of the sun, the moon, and the oceans, semi-precious stones connect us to earth as soon as we come into contact with them. Each crystal has a unique vibrational energy that works to clear blockages and ward off negative energy. Here's a summation of how crystal healing is supposed to work according to the Book of Stones and there's a lot of jargon in this one. 
When we bring the crystal into our electromagnetic field, two things occur. The electromagnetic frequencies carried by the stone will vibrate with related frequencies in our own energy field through the physical law of resonance, creating a third larger vibrational field. The nervous system is attuned to these shifts in energy and transmits this information to the brain. Here, the frequencies stimulate biochemical shifts that affect the physical body and shift brain function. In the physical world, you pick up a crystal and feel it as something separate from you that you're just holding. But on higher frequencies, you're actually interacting with that stone energetically. This interaction then causes changes to your structure and psychology through your own energetic systems. It begins a process of rebalancing the energetic structure of your body, and in a sense, can help you heal. Now, consciousness is of course the determining factor of if you are going to be accepting of these new frequencies coming into your being through crystals. I'm not going to say crystals will heal you, because if you fight them and are non-receptive to these frequencies, you will continue to create the disharmony within yourself. Ultimately though, crystals can be used to retune your whole being back to a state of harmony and flow. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves, is there any evidence that crystals actually have healing properties? Is there any evidence that suggests that this is true? And the only real study we have on this subject demonstrates to us that crystals are no more effective in producing healing than a placebo. Psychologist Dr. Christopher French and colleagues from the University of London conducted a study to determine if crystal healing was legitimate. 80 participants were asked to fill out a questionnaire to indicate how open they were to the supernatural, and then they were asked to meditate with a crystal in their hand. Some of these crystals were real, and some of them were fake. They didn't know whether the crystal in their hand was real or was fake. Before meditating, they were asked to observe any tingling or energy running through their hand while holding onto the crystal. After they finished meditating, they answered another questionnaire where they recorded any effects they felt from the crystal in their hand those who held real crystals experienced no greater effects than those who held fake crystals. Interestingly, those who were more open to the supernatural experienced more sensation in their hand, as did those who were primed and encouraged more by the person conducting the study. We found that lots of people claimed that they could feel odd sensations while holding the crystals, such as tingling, heat, and vibrations, if we told them in advance that this is what might happen. In other words, the effects reported were a result of the power of suggestion, not the power of crystals. There is no evidence that crystal healing works over and above a placebo effect. So what this demonstrates to us is that it doesn't matter what type of rock is in your hand, it could be soil, it could be an ordinary stone, it could be a piece of wood. What's going to create the sensation and the feelings of energy transference and any healing is your psychological disposition to the object you are holding. So contrary to the statements of those in the New Age movement and what the billion dollar crystal industry would have us believe, there is no actual evidence that crystals have any healing ability. So practically speaking, they aren't useful for anything. It's not enough to say, well, the silicone in crystals can conduct electricity, therefore they can conduct or they emit metaphysical energy just doesn't follow. Now, biblically speaking, there are two primary ways we can understand the use of crystals in healing and in therapy. Whether or not they work in some scenarios or in some instances or not at all, to use them for healing or for any spiritual purpose is to commit a form of idolatry. An idol is anything that replaces the one true God. Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed himself in the word. So idolatry in a narrow sense is to worship objects or beings in the place of God. But in a broad sense, idolatry is when we use or revere anything in the place of God. So when we look to something God created to provide us with supernatural healing, spiritual healing that only God can provide, we commit a form of spiritual idolatry. Let's look at a few verses where God is clearly identified as being our spiritual healer. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. O Lord, I cried to you for help, and you have healed me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Additionally, there are dozens of verses about God being our emotional healer and our physical healer, but these verses in particular indicate that God is our supernatural healer, healing us from the spirit outward. This happens initially when our spirit man is resurrected from spiritual death to spiritual life in Christ through faith, through something known as regeneration. And then we're continuously being renewed and brought to life day by day through sanctification by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we go from being spiritually dead in trespasses and sins to sharing in the resurrection life of Jesus. And crystals, gemstones, they cannot do this for you. If you're using crystals in spiritual healing or spiritual therapy, you are bypassing God's method of spiritual healing and you're using the creation rather than the creator to bring about this effect in your life. And even if they do not work and don't produce any effect in reality, this is still a textbook example of idolatry. Now this is not true of medicine because medicine does not seek to bring about supernatural healing to the patient. The use of crystals, however, attempts to bring about supernatural metaphysical healing that only God can bring us. And when we appeal to created things for supernatural use in the place of God himself, we fall short of God's standard to revere, adore, and value nothing else above him. 
So even if they don't work, the first way we can understand the use of crystals is idolatry. Now, if they do work, we can also understand them as being witchcraft. Because what you're doing is you're trying to manipulate metaphysical energy apart from God for your own benefit, which falls under the category of sorcery, magic, and witchcraft, all of which are prohibited in scripture. So even if crystals could be used for magic arts in some way to bring through energies from archangels or from ascended masters, or could act as some kind of a wand to project your energy through into a patient or a subject, to do so is to transgress God's commandment that we should refrain from sorcery. The definition of magic is the use of means, such as charms or spells, believed to have supernatural power over natural forces. The art of producing a desired effect or result through the use of incantation or various other techniques that presumably assure human control of supernatural agencies or the forces of nature. Witchcraft is the religious practice involving magic and affinity with nature, usually within a pagan tradition. Witchcraft is the art or power of bringing magical or preternatural power to bear, or the act or practice of attempting to do so and sorcery is, of course, the use of magic. The Bible says, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And the NIV sorcerers here is actually translated as those who practice magic arts. So even if they do work under certain circumstances, using them is condemned in the Bible and is something that is incompatible with salvation. No practicer of magic will enter into heaven on judgment day. Only those saved by faith with the evidence of repentance from such forms of sorcery will see the kingdom of God. So the use of crystals for metaphysical purposes, it's idolatry and it's witchcraft. Now I'm personally agnostic as to whether or not they serve any occultic purpose at all. Perhaps it's the case that once we yield to the principalities over witchcraft and over sorcery, crystals do act as a sort of transmitter for demons to bring their power through into the natural. Some kind of occultic tool might have been used, for example, in Exodus chapter 7 and Exodus chapter 8, where the magicians of Egypt were able to replicate Moses and Aaron's miracles. And I find it interesting that a lot of the channeled material, the material that comes through contact with interdimensional entities who we we call demons, it always seems to be pointing people back towards the usage of crystals. And that doesn't really make sense to me personally if they're absolutely vacuous and empty of all purpose. So I'm personally agnostic as to whether or not they offer some metaphysical benefit in the practice of witchcraft. But if they do, it's condemned in scripture as a sin worthy of hell. Now, can Christians use crystals for jewelry or for decor? The answer is obviously yes. They're not bad in and of themselves just because they've been abused for occultic purposes. Crystals are a part of God's creation, which he called good. However, if you've just come out of the New Age movement, it's not a good idea to surround yourself with the same occultic tools that your brain and your soul is used to associating with a certain spiritual experience, whether that be a mystical experience or a transcendental experience or even just feelings of nostalgia. It's kind of like if you're used to associating a certain song with an ex-partner of yours, then you decide to listen to that song over and over and over again. It's not going to be healthy for you psychologically or spiritually. So I would say if you have a history in the New Age movement, I would not have anything to do with crystals because I don't want to put a stumbling block before myself and interfere with the process of sanctification that God's trying to work in me. I have two videos on occult objects which address how they give demons legal ground and how holding onto these objects prevents your mind and soul from being able to renew and refresh itself from association with occult objects. So to recap, crystals are useless for healing in and of themselves. And since God alone is to be the source of our spiritual healing, crystal healing and therapy is idolatrous by nature. If it does in fact work, then it's also witchcraft. And it might be the case that crystals do serve some kind of occult purpose when used in conjunction with demonic power. Crystals are not evil in and of themselves, but wisdom and caution should be used if you are planning on using them for decor or jewelry, especially if you have a history in the New Age movement. what Jesus believed about God. Now we're not going to go into what Jesus believed about the attributes or the characteristics of God. Namely, we're going to look at what did Jesus believe about the identity of God. Which one was he? Who was the father that Jesus kept speaking about? Jesus often gets labeled as being a Buddhist, a yogi, a mystic, or a Gnostic, and we are told that the father is really just life force energy, a universal source field at the heart of nature, prana, the all, the universe, the energy of the universe, etc. God is the universe. God is matter and energy and consciousness. There is nothing outside that universal consciousness. Because in John 14, 12, Jesus actually says, As I do these things, meaning the miracles, so shall you do them, and greater things, for I go unto my Father. 
The Father is the field. The Father is the intelligence of the cosmos. But Jesus himself told us who the Father is, and the description he gives eliminates any kind of room for these alternative or New Age interpretations of God. So let's take a look at what Jesus believed about God. So the first point is that Jesus believed God is a personal being. And by personal, we don't mean that God is a human or that God is embodied. We mean personal in a philosophical sense, that God has self-awareness, agency, the ability to produce a new effect, freedom of the will. So contrary to Hinduism, for example, where God is taught to be an impersonal force that permeates the universe, Jesus describes the Father as having a distinct will, which is an attribute of being a person. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Not only does God have a will, God has volition, the ability to act on his will and produce a new effect in reality. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask? If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So God not only has a will, he has the ability to act on his will, something an impersonal force cannot do. Another thing that indicates to us God is a personal being is Jesus speaks about the Father as having knowledge. And in order to have knowledge of facts, that requires a personal consciousness. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. An impersonal field can't know something, nor can an impersonal field speak, something the Father does at least three different times in the Gospels. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Another thing is that Jesus straight up calls the Father a person in John chapter 8. When the Pharisees start pressing him about the testimony he has about himself, Jesus tells the Pharisees, is it not written in your law that the witness of two people is what is needed to provide an account for something? And he says, I bear witness of myself and the Father bears witness of me. So he's indicating that the Father is a person aside from him who is bearing witness to his testimony. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who send me. In your law, it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Now, prana, life force energy, and Brahman cannot possess free will, the ability to produce an effect in reality, possess knowledge, or verbally speak from heaven. These are the attributes of a personal agent, and since Jesus believed in a personal God, this automatically eliminates pantheism, pandeism, and Eastern concepts of God. Now, the second thing that Jesus believed about the Father is that the Father is a transcendent being who is residing in heaven. He's outside of space and time, outside of nature. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And call no man your Father on earth, for you have one Father who is in heaven. So God is described by Jesus to be a personal, transcendent being operating outside of time and space from heaven. Another thing Jesus reveals about the identity of God is that this personal, transcendent being operating from heaven is the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of the Jews. Speaking about the resurrection, Jesus says, but that the dead are raised to life. Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Now here's the best verse. Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. So he's speaking here to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were monotheistic Old Testament Jews who held to the Hebrew Scriptures. And Jesus is saying to them, The one who they believe is their God, Yahweh, is actually his Father. So we've seen how Jesus believed that the Father was personal, transcendent, and the God of the Old Testament. We're also going to see how Jesus believed that the Father is the author of the Old Testament. He revealed himself through the commandments given in the Old Testament. 
Speaking to the Pharisees, Jesus references Exodus 20, verse 12, and he says, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If anyone tells his father or his mother what you would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Once again, he's referring to the Old Testament commandments given in Exodus chapter 20. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the living. So Jesus believed that God was a personal, transcendent God of the Old Testament, who is residing in heaven, who gave the Torah to the Jewish people. Jesus was a radical monotheist who held to an Old Testament worldview and believed that the creator of the universe is Yahweh. Now this goes without saying that Jesus believed he shared identity with Yahweh, in some fundamental sense which gets into the doctrine of the Trinity. But without getting into that too much, we can see that Jesus clearly revealed to us that the Father is not a source field or a universal being worshipped by other religious systems. The Father is Yahweh, the personal monotheistic deity who revealed himself to the Hebrew people of the Old Testament. common idea within the New Age movement is the idea that Jesus was a mystic, teaching us the inner path of enlightenment. This is an idea that is taught by people like Deepak Chopra, Eckhart Tolle, and is an idea I myself used to entertain. And this idea comes primarily from a verse found in Luke chapter 17, where it reads, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So people who are involved in new spirituality use this verse and try to infer from it that the kingdom of God is actually an internal spiritual reality waiting to be accessed by us through enlightenment, ego death, and self-discovery. When we transcend our egos, we enter into the I am presence that is within each one of us at the core of our beings. And so the kingdom of God is not something that is external to us, but is something we come to the realization of through contemplation, meditation, and self-surrender, where we enter into unity consciousness. So the kingdom of God is a level of being that is already unified with God, which we arrive at through ego death and a shift in consciousness. And so what we're going to do in this video is look at the correct interpretation of this verse, along with five arguments that this verse cannot possibly be interpreted in a mystical sense, and then one additional argument that Jesus could not possibly have been a mystic. So before jumping to the idea that this must be a reference to, to mysticism or to some kind of Eastern concept of enlightenment, we should first survey what theologians and biblical scholars say about this verse. So this verse, in a Christian context, is referring to God's spiritual kingdom that is being established within the hearts of believers here on earth. God's kingdom will not be seen in terms of some physical buildings or a specific geographical location. It's established in the hearts and in the spirits of those who are born again in his son. When you actively believe on Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, and believe in your heart that he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead, his spirit bears itself in you. So his kingdom is here on earth in terms of Christians being vessels for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is how God's kingdom is manifesting itself in the world right now. So this verse means that God's kingdom will be manifested on earth in the hearts of believers via the Holy Spirit. Now let's look at five different reasons why this verse could not possibly be referring to an internal reality waiting to be discovered by us or something along these lines. The first argument why Jesus was not saying that the kingdom of God is already within everybody is that the people he said this to, he specifically called the children of Satan. The Pharisees whom he said this to, he also called blind guides, fools, full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Serpents, a generation of vipers, hypocrites. He asked them, how can you escape the damnation of hell? He even said that their father is the devil. So Jesus is clearly not saying that the kingdom of God is within the same people whom he called blind children of Satan who are damned to hell. So we can know that Jesus wasn't meaning to say the kingdom of God is already within everybody if he specifically told the Pharisees that the kingdom of God wasn't within them. In fact, we can expand upon this point, which leads to the second argument, which is that the entire New Testament, and in fact the entire Bible, is premised on the idea that the kingdom of God is not already within us. That's one of the reasons Christ died, is so that we could be reconciled back to God, from whom we are now separated through sin. Outside of faith in Jesus, the Bible says we are children of wrath, enemies of God, children of the devil, and in some cases even of the spirit of Antichrist. And so while this may be offensive to some people, it's important to note, because the Bible says very clearly that the kingdom of God is not within us. In fact, it says specifically that we are separated from God. And of course, we get reconciled back to God through faith in Jesus Christ and not through works of self-discovery or works of one's own righteousness. 
And so Jesus is clearly not saying that the kingdom of God is already within everybody, waiting to be realized if the very people he said this to he called the children of Satan, and if the entire Bible and the entire gospel is premised on the idea that we are separated from God. Now some people might be like, wait a minute, sure Jesus said this to the Pharisees, but the kingdom of God was still within them in some way. It just wasn't activated within them because they hadn't experienced an ego death and they hadn't tapped into the inner presence of God within them. So Jesus called them children of the devil and blind because they lacked self-awareness and they lacked the vision to see that the presence of God was already within them. And this is actually not possible because when we look at this verse, Jesus is speaking about the kingdom of God as something that hadn't even arrived yet at the time when he said this. An argument could be made that the kingdom of God wasn't within anybody at that time other than Jesus. And this is why he spoke in future tense about something that would arrive in the future. Let's take a look at this verse one more time. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say in the future, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Notice how it says, neither shall they say, meaning they will not, in the future, say this about the kingdom of God. This is future tense here. And the word for cometh, in Greek, is the same word used for coming, which is why most English translations say that the kingdom of God is not coming, in the future, with observation. If Jesus wanted to say that the kingdom of God was already within them, he would have been speaking in present tense. If he was speaking in present tense about something that was already within them, he would have said something like this. The kingdom of God has not, or does not, come in a way that can be observed. Do not say, look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. This is how the verse would read if Jesus was trying to communicate that God's kingdom is already here, present as an internal reality of some sort. They asked him when the kingdom of God would come in the future, and Jesus answered them, telling them how it would come and how it would be established in the future, which means that it couldn't have already been within them. And as we know from the previous two points, Jesus certainly wasn't saying it was already within them. So Jesus could not be referring to an internal state of being already within everybody waiting to be realized if in this narrative he is speaking of it in something that hasn't even arrived yet. And so this means, of course, that it couldn't have already been within the Pharisees. A fourth argument against the mystical interpretation of this verse is that this probably isn't even the best translation of this verse. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And if we go back to the Greek word for within, it is called entos. But entos doesn't just mean within, it can also mean among or in the midst of. So while this verse can be translated to the kingdom of God is within you, it can also be translated to the kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, which would of course be Jesus referring to himself and the establishment of his kingdom, which starts with him and his ministry. Something that I wish I knew as a New Ager trying to interpret this verse and struggling with, you know, what did Jesus really mean here, is the fact that most English translations don't even say that the kingdom of God is within you. Here's a list of the English translations that don't read the kingdom of God is within you. The ESV, the NASB, the NIV, the NRSV, the NLT, the RSV, the CEB, the CJB, along with 20 other English translations. So just as well as someone could say, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, one could say that he didn't even say that, and they'd be just as correct, if not more correct, if we we're going to go with what most Bibles and literary scholars say about this verse. So it seems to me like the mystic has a dilemma here. If he wants to give a mystical interpretation on this verse, he has to deal with the fact that he can only choose one third of the possible translations of this verse. And he has to cherry pick from the minority of Bible translations. Whereas a Christian can pick up an ESV or a KJV, and 100% of the possible translations are compatible with a Christian worldview. So the fourth argument is basically that Jesus probably didn't even say this, and that the verse is better translated to among you or in the midst of you, which is why most translations don't say the kingdom of God is within you. A fifth argument is that other verses in the Bible warn against these kinds of interpretations of the Gospels and of Jesus specifically. So this couldn't possibly be a reference to mysticism. Paul says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. And then about these people who teach these kinds of gospels, he says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Paul also says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. And check this out. 
But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? For if I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So in these verses, Paul is saying that any gospel or any version of Jesus, other than the one he is preaching, is a false gospel, and that those who preach it are false apostles. And to understand what Paul's gospel is, all we really have to do is read the Pauline epistles. Here's just a couple verses, really quick summary of what Paul's gospel is. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Paul's gospel is really simple, that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and not through works of self-development or righteousness. Now the reason why this is a knockdown argument against a mystical interpretation of this verse is that Paul actually saw Jesus himself. Not only did he see Jesus and receive this information from Jesus directly, he spent two weeks with Jesus' disciple Peter and Jesus' brother James. And he also checked his gospel against the gospels of Peter, James, and John to make sure they were on the same page and to make sure he wasn't, quote, running in vain. And as he says, they added nothing to me. So Paul saw Jesus three years after his crucifixion, was taught directly by Jesus, spent two weeks with Jesus' disciple and brother to talk and make sure they were on the same page, and then went back to double check over a decade later and found out he was still preaching the exact same gospel as Jesus' direct disciple and his brother, both of whom were eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry. So Paul is clearly the ultimate authority on what the gospel actually is. And he warns against false interpretations of the gospel and false versions of Jesus specifically, and says that anyone who teaches anything contrary to what he teaches is a false apostle teaching lies. So the fifth argument is that this verse could not possibly be a reference to mysticism if it contradicts and was warned of specifically by Paul, who was taught directly by Jesus and checked his material against his disciple and his brother, both of whom were taught directly by Jesus. So, so far we've looked at the correct interpretation of this scripture, and we've looked at five different arguments that this could not possibly be a reference to mysticism or some kind of internal path of enlightenment. And now we're going to look at one additional argument, which is that Jesus was simply not a mystic. He was a monotheistic Jew who believed in the God of the Old Testament. Now, there are many, many, many ways to establish that Jesus was not a mystic, but what we're going to look at here in particular is the Jewishness of Jesus. Jesus believed in the authority and divine inspiration of the Torah and the scriptures of the Jewish prophets. And in fact, in Mark 7, he specifically calls the commandments of Moses and the Torah the word of God. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And then he says, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. So how could Jesus be a mystic if he believes that the Old Testament and the Torah is the literal word of God? We often forget that Jesus was a practicing Jew. He kept all of the Jewish high feast days, such as the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Dedication. He even claimed to be the Lord of the Sabbath. This is someone that believed in and preached the Old Testament. He grew up as a Jew in the synagogue. He even taught in the synagogue from the scriptures. He believed that the scriptures could not be broken and that they were the literal word of God. Jesus was a Jew, he was not a mystic, which is why his disciples called him rabbi, which means Jewish teacher, over a dozen times in scripture. And the final point on the Jewishness of Jesus, which is a knockdown argument against him being a mystic, was that he claimed specifically that his father, that God, was Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, whom the Pharisees claimed to believe in. As he says in John 8 verse 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say, he is our God. So Jesus claims specifically here that his father was the God of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were, of course, Jewish. So how could Jesus be a mystic if he claimed that his father was Yahweh, the monotheistic deity of the Old Testament? So to summarize this point, Jesus was a practicing Jew who believed that the Old Testament was the literal word of God and claimed that his father was the God of the Pharisees, the God of the Old Testament. So we've looked at how the correct interpretation of this verse is talking about God's spiritual kingdom established within the hearts of believers. 
We've looked at how Jesus also called the Pharisees children of Satan, which means that the kingdom of God couldn't have already been within them. We've looked at how the whole Bible and the entire New Testament is premised on the idea that the kingdom of God is not within us. We've looked at how in this narrative, Jesus is referring to the kingdom of God as something that hadn't even arrived yet, which means that he couldn't have been saying it's already within us. We've looked at how this probably isn't even the best translation of this verse, and how most translations of this verse actually don't say that the kingdom of God is within you. We've looked at how Paul, who was taught by Jesus and checked his material against eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry, warned against false versions of Jesus and false gospels specifically, contrary to the one that he taught. And we've looked at how Jesus was a monotheistic Jew, a practicing Jew, who worshipped and claimed to be sent by the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh. And for those who have watched this far, who might have come into this video thinking that Jesus was a mystic or something like this, I would encourage these people to go back and read the Gospels. I remember the first time I started listening to the Gospels after becoming a Christian, I was completely blown away at how naive and false my ideas of Jesus were. Like, they were not based on anything that was actually found in Scripture. It was just me basically repeating and recycling versions of Jesus that I had heard talked about by Muji or Deepak Chopra or other people. It wasn't actually based in anything Jesus said, did, or believed. In fact, everything Jesus said, did, and believed seemed to contradict what I thought I knew about him. And so while an Eastern, pantheistic interpretation of reality might seem intuitive or attractive to some people, it does not and cannot apply to the person of Jesus. In fact, it's contradicted by the person of Jesus. If Jesus is who he claimed to be, then mysticism is false and panentheism is false. And I would encourage you once again to go back and read the Gospels, read the New Testament, and allow the words of Jesus and allow the scriptures to speak for themselves. When the Jews picked up stones to stone Jesus, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Jesus here is referring to a verse in Psalm 82, 6, where it reads, I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. As you can imagine, this passage has caused a lot of confusion, especially in the New Age movement. It's often interpreted Gnostically to mean that we are little gods ascending up a ladder of deification, or mystically to mean that God is within all things and therefore within us. And it's usually presented with a lot of gusto and confidence, as if it's a sort of knockdown argument against Christianity. When Jesus is talking to the crowd in the Gospel of John, when people start to stone him and he says, many good works have I shown you, for which of these do you stone me? And they say, we stone you not for a good work that you do, we stone you for blasphemy because you being a man, call yourself a God. And what does Jesus do? He says, is it not written in your law that you are gods? If it can be said of those to whom the word, the logos, the knowledge of God came, the consciousness of God came, that they are gods, then why do you say I blaspheme? As Deepak Chopra says about this verse, I interpreted this as those who have knowledge of God are God. In Eastern philosophical systems, there's an established idea of a path through personal consciousness to a collective conscience to a universal conscience, which people call the divine. I concluded that Jesus must have experienced this consciousness. In an article called You Are God, The Real Teachings of Jesus, it says the following. Jesus is clearly telling each and every one of us, resounding to the world from 2,000 years ago, that we are indeed God. That you are God. Every person, without exception, is God. So in this video, we're going to answer a few questions. Who was this verse addressing? Why were they referred to as being gods? Why did Jesus bring up this verse in the first place? And was Jesus trying to teach everyone that we are all gods? Now, there are four primary competing theories on who this psalm is referring to. The most generally accepted view is that the psalmist was writing to earthly judges, and we will see why this is true when we read Psalm 82, 6 in context. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die, and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Notice how in verses 2, 3, and 4, God is telling them to do a better job restoring justice on earth. Judge justly, give justice to the weak, maintain the right of the afflicted. For someone who wants to say this verse refers to all of mankind, the average person does not have the authority to maintain another person's rights. 
This is a legal and judicial function, which is the job of judges, kings, and magistrates. There's a very rich history of judges and kings in the Old Testament starting in Exodus 18, when Moses elected people as God's representatives to settle disputes among the people of Israel. It says Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times, any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Now this verse is really important and we'll come back to this in a bit, but this is how legal and moral disputes were resolved. God rebukes such judges in a very similar manner in Isaiah 3, 13 to 15, Isaiah 3, 24, 26, Micah 3, 9, 12, and in Psalm 58 where it says, Do you indeed decree what is right, you gods? Do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your hearts you devise wrongs. Your hands deal out violence on earth. Once again, the average person does not have the ability to make decrees and judgments over other people. Only people of legal authority can make moral decrees over other men. The object of the Lord's admonishment, the ones whom he is calling gods, are the ones who are in a position to enforce the law of God over the Hebrew people. So this verse is not a reference to all of mankind, obviously, but to judges, and not to judges of all nations, but to judges of Israel in particular. These are the sons of the Most High, his chosen people to whom the word of God came, as Jesus says. Only those to whom the word of God came were referred to as gods. And the word of God did not come to every single person in the world, but to the nation of Israel alone. Which makes this an extremely exclusive reference that excludes 99.999% of people who have ever lived, including everyone who is watching this right now. So if they're really human judges, why does he call them gods? He calls them gods in a figurative and mythopoetic sense to express their position of authority. They were the ones elected by God to hold the quasi-divine position of judge. It's a reference to power, role, and relation, not deity. The Hebrew word used here is Elohim. It's used over 2,000 times to refer to God, and 259 times to refer to any kind of spiritual being in general. But it's also used to refer to human judges put in God's place to carry out his will. Remember we mentioned the election of judges in Exodus 18? These same judges were called Elohim in Exodus 21 verse 6. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door of the doorpost. In the King James Version, the New King James Version, the Christian Standard Bible, the Geneva Bible, and even the NIV, it's translated here to judges, because these verses refer to human judges acting in God's place. Yet God saw it fit to call these newly elected judges Elohim because of their role among the people. Exodus 22 verses 8, verses 9, and verses 28 are other examples where Elohim is referring to these human judges elected as God's representatives. This small handful of times is the only time you will see humans referred to as Elohim. As John Calvin says in his commentary on the Gospel of John, Scripture gives the name of God to those on whom God has conferred an honorable office. The passage which Christ quotes is in Psalm 82 verse 6, I have said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, where God expostulates with the kings and judges of the earth who tyrannically abuse their authority and power for their own sinful passions, for oppressing the poor, and for every evil action. So this is nowhere close to a reference to deity for every single human. It's a metaphorical reference to the quasi-divine role given to a very narrow class of people, judges in Israel. So why did Jesus bring up this verse in the first place? What Jesus is doing here is making an argument from lesser to greater. He was just finished saying that he is one with the Father. In John chapter 5, 22, he says, The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. In John 8, 16, he says, Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. So he's saying, if mere mortals were called Elohim for representing his law in Israel, how much more can I claim deity for myself when I represent him perfectly in all things? Why do you say I blaspheme when I have more power, authority, and deity than the ones called gods in the Old Testament? If men to whom God's word came can be called Elohim, then even more so can I be called Elohim as the living and breathing word of God. So he said this to deflect their charges of blasphemy against them and to demonstrate that he was well within his rights and authority to claim deity for himself. So now we are going to look at proof that Jesus did not mean that we are all little gods or can become gods through enlightenment like the New Age tells us. The first point is that the gods mentioned in Psalm 82 are said to have no knowledge or understanding. It says they have neither knowledge nor understanding, they walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. This verse alone immediately debunks Chopra's interpretation of this verse, that through the knowledge of God we become gods, since they were called gods despite having no knowledge or understanding, which means he must have been calling them gods for a reason other than enlightenment or special knowledge. Now the second argument is actually kind of funny, so let's take a look at the track record of people who believe themselves to be a god in scripture. Now Jesus claimed to be God and he was honored by the Father because he was speaking the truth. Let's look at what happens in scripture when an ordinary human being claims to be God. 
The first one is the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28. And God says to him, Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of the gods in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man, and no god. Because you make your heart like the heart of a god, therefore, behold, I will bring foreigners upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom, and defile your splendor. They shall thrust you down into the pit, and you shall die the death of the slain in the heart of the seas. Will you still say, I am a god, in the presence of those who kill you? So this king believed he was a god, and the Lord tells him he is just a man, and then sends people to kill him because of his pride. That's a pretty strong rebuke. The second person is the king of Babylon in Isaiah 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you were brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 are believed to contain references to the fall of Lucifer from heaven the spiritual power behind these kings, whom God is simultaneously addressing. This is the very kind of belief that led to Lucifer's fall from heaven. King Herod, a persecutor of the early Christians shortly after the resurrection of Jesus, received praise for himself as a god in the book of Acts, where it reads, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god, and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last breath. King Herod was killed on the spot for receiving praise for being a god. There is only one other person in the Bible who claims that he is God, and this is the Antichrist. Paul writes, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come, unless the rebellion first comes, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And we know from Revelation 19.20 and 20.10 that this Antichrist will be thrown into the lake of fire for eternity. If Jesus was really teaching that men are all gods, God would have set a better biblical precedence for divinity claimers than capital punishment and hellfire. When the Apostle Paul was praised as being a god in Acts 14, he got so upset that he ripped his clothes and said, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. The reason he called this idea vain is because the Bible teaches that people are but men, that there is only one God and this God shares his glory with no one else. The third point is that this false interpretation echoes the first lie Satan ever told to man. This is actually the opposite of what Jesus believed. When Eve told Satan that God forbade them to eat of that one tree, Satan says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Or as it says in the King James Version, ye shall be as gods. This is literally the oldest lie in the book, brought into the world by the enemy of Jesus, that through some kind of special knowledge, we can become an immortal God. We are hearing the same idea echoed by the New Age movement. To believe what the New Age tells us about Psalm 82.6 is to believe the words of Satan himself in Genesis 3. So we have seen the correct meaning and context of John 10.34 and Psalm 82. We've seen why these judges were called Elohim. We've seen why Jesus brought this verse up in the first place, how those who tried to take credit for being a god in the Bible were served the death penalty by God, that this is what the Antichrist will believe about himself. We've seen how Paul responded to people who were praising him as a god, and we've seen how this echoes the original lie that Satan told Eve in the garden. We can clearly see Jesus was not telling every person on earth that they are all little gods in an esoteric or mystical sense. What Jesus really taught is that we are lost in sin, fallen from God, that he alone is the mediator between us and the Father, and that we must believe on his atoning work on the cross in order to receive the gift of salvation. So we're going to be looking at the concept of Christ consciousness. And in particular, we're going to look at how this is something that Jesus himself actually warned would arise as a deception during the final times before his second coming. For those who aren't familiar with this idea, Christ consciousness is a philosophy within new spirituality that teaches that Christ is an inward state of consciousness and a state of divine awareness that can be accessed through each person. According to this model, Christ is who we ultimately are because Christ is a nature that we all have. It's a nature we access when we tap into our most pure and formless state of being. It is the I am presence within every person. So Christ is not someone outside of us. Christ is something that we step into realization of through an inner awakening of our true nature. And our true nature is ultimately union with God, which means that our true nature and potential is ultimately Christ. 
Christ consciousness is believed to be the state of consciousness of realizing that one is as Christ was, unified with God. So Jesus is someone who actually became Christ by realizing that he already was God at his innermost core. And so since everyone is God at their innermost core, we are all Christ too. We just haven't realized it yet like Jesus did. And before we refute this biblically, let's take a look at some of the quotes from the leading New Age teachers in the whole world on this idea of Christ consciousness. Is he, Jesus, the Christ? Oh yes, along with you. Accepting the Christ is merely a shift in self-perception. Even if he takes another name, even if he takes another face, he is, in essence, the truth of who we are. There is only one begotten Son doesn't mean that someone else was it and we are not. It means that we are all it. There's only one of us here. And these last few quotes have come from someone who has four number one New York Times bestselling books. So this is no small time underground New Age author here. Let's take a look at a few quotes from Barbara Marks Hubbard speaking in the place of Jesus. You were born to be me. The church is the body of believers who are conscious of being me. Many have been Christed, not just Jesus of Nazareth. You can be Christed too. You are quite literally the word of God made flesh. Neil Donald Walsh's first book, Conversations with God, An Uncommon Dialogue, sold more than 7 million copies by itself and remained on the New York Times bestseller list for 135 consecutive weeks. And The Course in Miracles has sold over 2.5 million copies. These two books have both been promoted by Oprah, so tens of millions of books have been sold teaching people that they are ultimately Christ. This is one of the core teachings of the New Age movement. And we could look at other videos too from people like Daryl Anka, Muji, David Icke, but what we're going to do is look at a video that was released a little over a month ago on the Spirit Science YouTube channel where Jordan summarizes all of the world's religions and then at the end he introduces this concept of Christ consciousness. So let's take a listen. You know, this idea of Jesus, whether it was him who said it or not, Christ is said to come to bring the sword rather than peace. And the reason for that is because it's believed that the awareness of the genuine Christ will cause division amongst people because Christ will be demonstrated through action, not only through ideology. And it's in the demonstration of Christ that other Christs will come and be like, oh my gosh, each and every one of us has the potential to unlock Christ within us, to understand and know Christ. We can all become it. So he says here that other Christ will arise, and he also says that Christ is something that we can become. We can all unlock within us, we can all become it. So he calls Christ an it here, we'll come back to that later. But right now let's look at Matthew 24, where Jesus actually warns against this philosophy specifically. So it reads, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So Jesus says here in the final days that many will come saying, I am Christ, and that this is actually a deception and a sign of the end times. So to believe that you can be Christ or that you are Christ is to fall under the warning Jesus gave about deception that will take place in the final days. I am Christ is what many shall say to deceive people according to Jesus. And now some people might say, wait a minute, this must be a reference to people claiming to be, you know, the literal incarnation of Jesus, and that Jesus is obviously warning against imposters in this verse. But the problem with this is that there are only about a dozen people who have literally claimed to be Jesus Christ, not all of which had cult followings. Here is a list of all the people who claim to be Jesus, and in what context they claim to be Jesus. And if we scroll through and read each one, we'll notice that there's only about 12. So when Jesus said that many will come in my name and lead many astray, he couldn't have been referring to 12 people and their insignificant cult followings that have all dissolved with time. Twelve is not many people, but what is many people is the millions and millions who are involved in the New Age movement who believe that they are literally Christ, because Christ is an inward state of consciousness. Jesus also says later in Matthew, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So in addition to fleeing from the deception of those who say, I am Christ, Jesus is also telling us here not to believe anyone who says, there is Christ. And once again, the New Age fulfills this prophecy by telling us that Jesus is something within you. Whether you want to say Christ is something you are, you can become, or something already within you, Jesus himself warns against these ideas in Matthew 24. Christ can't be something already dormant within your heart if Jesus Christ says not to believe anyone who tells you where Christ is. And when it comes down to it, guys, this is the first and oldest lie in the book. Remember Satan told Eve that she can become immortal and become like God if she rebels against God and eats from the tree that would give her secret knowledge? 
We are seeing this exact same lie manifesting in the New Age, where we are now told we can all become Christ. In Genesis 3, it reads, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan is the first one to come up with the idea that through some kind of inner wisdom or knowledge, we can become like God. And we are hearing this echoed from the New Age teachers who are telling us we can all become like Christ through ascending to higher consciousness. And we will look more deeply into Genesis and its relation to New Age theology in another video, but for now it's important to realize that Christ consciousness is the same type of idea that first came from the enemy of Jesus in the Bible. And check this out, this is kind of funny. So the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And the first and most significant work of the devil was to tell Eve she could be like God. This is the lie that led to mankind's separation from God and infected humanity with sin, which Jesus came to destroy. So the entire reason he came was to destroy the works of the one who told us we can all become like God. The lie that we can be God or be like God, according to the Bible, is ultimately what brought sin into the world in the first place, and eventually what led to the death of Jesus on the cross. It's ironic to think that the version of Christ taught by someone like Deepak Chopra, for example, is one that not only Jesus himself warned against, it's one that actually caused the sin that Jesus said he came to die for in the first place. So we have seen how Jesus warned against this idea specifically and told us not to believe anyone who says, here is Christ or I am Christ. And we have seen how this idea of Christ consciousness perfectly parallels Satan's original lie to Eve in the Bible. And I think this should be enough to convince us that Christ consciousness is false, but we're gonna take a look at a few more arguments to just really put the nail in the coffin here. Another point against this idea of Christ consciousness is the fact that John the Baptist, whom Jesus said is the greatest among any man who has ever lived, denied being Christ. If Christ is something we can all become, why did the greatest man ever deny being Christ? Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Now let's see what John the Baptist says about himself here. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And then later on they ask him, Then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor a prophet? And John answered, saying, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So this is someone, guys, who is led by the Spirit of God in the wilderness, living off of bugs and honey. Someone predicted in the Old Testament a thousand years before he was even born. Someone who baptized Jesus Christ himself. And someone who Jesus said was the greatest who ever lived. And he denies being Christ. So if the greatest man ever is not Christ, how are we Christ? If Christ was really just an inner nature we can all manifest in us, or arrive at, surely the greatest man ever would have told us something about him having Christ consciousness or being Christ, but he doesn't. A fourth point to make against this idea of Jesus teaching Christ consciousness is that it's a misuse of the word Christ. The word Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. This is a word which is only used in scripture to describe Jesus. Remember how Jordan said that we can all become it? What the New Age movement does is create a new definition of the word Christ and turn Christos from a he to an it. Out of the 538 times Christos is used in the New Testament, it's always used as a he to refer to a person, in particular Jesus. It's never spoken of as something that could describe a state of being or a state of consciousness. A perfect example of this is in 1 Corinthians 15 starting at verse 3 where it says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So a state of consciousness can't die and then be buried in a tomb and then appear to 500 men. That doesn't make sense if we're going to adopt this new age definition of the word Christ. The verse reads, he was buried, he was raised, not it was buried, and it was raised. A state of consciousness can't die and then be buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. So by believing this idea of Christ consciousness, we have to adopt a new definition of the word Christos that doesn't make sense in terms of how this word was actually used. And there are other ways to refute this idea too, such as how Christ consciousness is a different type of Jesus than Paul taught, which he warned of specifically in Galatians 1 verses 8 to 13, how this perverts the simplicity of Christ, and Paul says those who do so are false apostles in 2 Corinthians 11, how Christ consciousness is a form of works-based salvation, when Paul says we are saved by grace through faith, not through our own works or our own doing. If you think that you can reach God through raising your own consciousness, you're in works-based salvation. And last but not least, how the Bible says things like, Put fear in them, O Lord. Let the nations know they are but men. 
or to the king of Tyre, God says, Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, yet you are but a man, and no god. Now this is actually a reference to Lucifer. It's widely accepted that Ezekiel 28 is a reference to the spiritual power behind the king of Tyre, a prideful spirit that wants to exalt itself to God's level. Or in 1 Corinthians, where it reads, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile, so let no one boast in men. So we have looked at how Jesus warned of those who say, I am Christ, and we have seen how this philosophy echoes the first lie Satan ever told mankind. We have seen how the greatest man ever, according to Jesus, denied being Christ. We have seen how this idea introduces a false definition of the word Christos, which isn't used a single time in scripture. And we have seen additional arguments varying from specific warnings against different gospels to verses telling us specifically that we are not God. So I really hope we can all see here that this idea does not come from Jesus or anything his disciples taught. In reality, it comes from Eastern mysticism, which has leaked over into the West through theosophy and through the New Age movement, and it also comes from channeled material. From a purely historical point of view, it doesn't reflect anything Jesus actually said. And we know this because we have four biographies that were either written by eyewitnesses or during the lifetimes of eyewitnesses. And we have Paul's epistles to the early churches, which were written by someone who saw Jesus himself and checked his gospel against Jesus' own brother and his disciple Peter. So we know what Jesus taught, and we have primitive source material going right back to the time of Jesus and the disciples. And when we draw our beliefs about Jesus from history itself, not only do we see that Christ consciousness is a topic that is completely absent from the ministry of Jesus, it's even warned of and contradicted by Jesus himself. And in addition to, you know, the arguments we've went through, we can know that Jesus did not teach this kind of mystical philosophy of Christ consciousness through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. When we believe on Jesus in our hearts, what he does is he gives us his spirit. And his spirit, since it's him, it confirms to us who he really is. And it teaches us all spiritual things. And if I could encourage you guys in one thing, it would be to seek Jesus for who he really is and pursue the Holy Spirit. Because the minute his presence bears itself in you, everything changes. And then you don't have to worry about, you know, who was Jesus because he lives inside you. You know who he is now. Hey guys, Steve here. In this video, we're going to cover one of the most prominent philosophies taught in the New Age movement, a philosophy that's even began to work its way into the Christian church, namely the law of attraction. In this video, we're going to ask the question, is it possible that the law of attraction is actually a deception? And if so, what do we do with the apparent success stories? And doesn't the Bible say things like, seek and you shall find, the power of life and death is in the tongue, ask and it will be given to you, etc.? We're going to get into all this, but before we do, let's first define the law of attraction. The law of attraction is the principle that we can attract whatever we want into our reality if we align our desires, our thoughts, our emotions, and our intentions with the result that we want. When we cultivate an inner world aligned with the desire we want, this will manifest in the outer world because there is a belief that there is a built-in metaphysical mechanism in the universe that will bring us that which is aligned with our dominant thoughts and emotions. It sends us events and experiences that already correspond to what's going on inside of us. The idea here is that like attracts like. So I'm going to attract something in my outer world that corresponds to what's going on in my inner world. So if I want a new partner in my life, for example, all I have to do is align my emotions and my thoughts with the result of having a new partner and the universe can't help but send me one. If I desire a new house, this law built into the universe will ensure I get a new house if I walk around saying positive affirmations, if I do visualizations of being in my new house, walk around in the feeling of already having received that new house, etc. We literally attract things into our reality with our internal states, hence the name, the law of attraction. And we can kind of hack the external world by adjusting our internal world with the result we want. We can manifest new things into our life. New Thought proponent Charles Hanel defined it in this way in the Master Key System back in 1912. The law of attraction will certainly and unerringly bring to you the conditions, environment, and experiences in life corresponding with your habitual, characteristic, predominant mental attitude. This teaching blew up with a book known as The Secret, published in 2006, which has sold over 30 million copies, later turned into a film in 2009, grossing over $300 million in sales. This is largely because it has been promoted heavily by Oprah Winfrey. She has actually said that the message of The Secret is precisely what she has been trying to teach her viewers for the last 21 years. But this teaching started to be taught in the West much earlier, in the 1800s, by someone named Phineas Quimby, which began to influence people like Mary Baker Eddy and other New Thought teachers. The term Law of Attraction was actually first coined by famous Luciferian occultist Helena Blavatsky in the late 1800s. Today it is taught by the likes of Deepak Chopra, Eckhart Tolle, Marianne Williamson, and even secular life coaches like Tony Robbins. As Marianne Williamson has said, imagine the most outrageously positive possibility for your life. Claim it, 
and consider it done. Match your thoughts and feelings with the result you want and the universe will begin conspiring in your favor. This is believed in by every New Age teacher and practitioner and is something I used to credit to my former financial success as a New Age writer. I believed that if I was fully confident I would be wealthy and successful, wealth and success would be sent to me through the Law of Attraction. Thankfully, I now know this isn't the case. So now that we know what the Law of Attraction teaching is, the first question we need to ask is does the Law of Attraction actually exist? And I want to use a thought experiment here of a lottery draw to show why the law of attraction cannot possibly be a law. It's not uncommon in the US for grand prize lottery draws to be upwards of $50 million. It's also not uncommon for people to begin amping themselves up before the lottery numbers are picked. They begin fantasizing about what they're going to get with all the money. They might bust out vision boards and draw up how they're going to spend their millions. They're praying. They're saying positive affirmations. They're making declarations out loud. They're amping themselves up. These are all law of attraction principles. The average major lottery has about 1 million participants. And I think it's safe to say that at least 0.1% of that million people, a thousand people, are practicing law of attraction principles, whether they're aware of it or not. Yet, only one person ends up winning the lottery. We have all these people that, according to the law of attraction, have all the right conditions present within themselves to attract the result of winning the lottery. Yet they don't attract anything. And they couldn't have, since there was only one possible winner. If this was really a law, we would expect that everyone who has the right conditions present in their inner world can't help but attract a corresponding outer world. But instead, we have all the right conditions present in their internal world, while literally nothing is attracted in the outer world. We have the right conditions to produce the effect without the effect being produced. We have the apparent cause without the apparent effect, which is proof it can't be a law. According to Webster's Dictionary, a law is, quote, a statement of an order or relation of phenomena that, so far is as known, is invariable under the given conditions. A law is only a law if the phenomenon that occurs is present 100% of the time that the right conditions are present. For example, every time you mix vinegar and baking soda, you will have a chemical reaction. It's impossible to mix vinegar and baking soda without this reaction occurring because of the laws of chemistry. There are laws of motion, laws of combustion, laws of nature, etc. If you throw gas onto an open fire, drop a bowling ball from the Eiffel Tower, or leave a banana peel on your counter overnight, you know exactly what's going to happen. If something is a law, then every time the right conditions are present, the phenomenon or occurrence will be unavoidable. In order for the law of attraction to be a law, the result of abundance would have to occur every single time a person has the right conditions present in themselves. This would have to be as unavoidable as a vinegar and baking soda reaction in order to be an actual law. The lottery, however, is an example where you have all of the right conditions present in tons of people without abundance being attracted by any of them. The alleged conditions are present within people while the phenomenon is absent in the outer world, which is proof this cannot be a law. And just like only one person can win the lottery, only one person can get that open job position. Let's say there is one job opening at a company and 100 people apply for the same job, all trying to utilize the law of attraction. Only one of them can actually get the job which means you have the right conditions present in 99 people to attract that job, but the effect isn't there. And like we have already established, something is only a law if it occurs every single time the right conditions are present. Now, someone may respond to this by saying, well, sure, it's not a literal law in the same way the laws of chemistry will necessitate a reaction from a vinegar and baking soda mix, but it does seem to be the way things are, generally speaking, even if it only works 10, 20, or 40% of the time. It seems to be the case that if you visualize, make declarations, say positive affirmations out loud, align your attitude and your emotions with the result you want, you're gonna increase your chances of attracting that into your life, even if it's not 100% guaranteed. And then they'll say, after all, consider all of the law of attraction success stories where people give really crazy testimonies about how the law of attraction worked for them. So right now we're going to go through four different explanations for why there are law of attraction success stories, despite there being no law of attraction. The first explanation is that these success stories are byproducts of the natural improvements one makes when they're trying to practice the law of attraction. If you are thinking positively, if you're walking in confidence, if you're making declarations and visualizations, this may help you get a raise at your job, for example. Why? Because by matching your internal world with the desire you want, you're going to be walking in more confidence. You're going to be walking in more assertiveness. You're going to be built up positively. You're going to be more decisive. And all of these things are desirable to employers. But the reason you're attracting this raise into your life is not because of some spiritual law. It's because by trying to practice the law of attraction, you're now walking in more confidence, more self-certainness, more assertiveness. And all of these properties are desirable. This may also improve your mood, causing you to be more charismatic 
and confident in the expression of your personality, which is also attractive to employers and even partners for that matter. People begin walking in confidence, setting goals and believing in themselves, and then attribute positive results to an invisible spiritual force in the universe rather than their own self-improvement. For example, with my prior success in the New Age, that came through being an opportunist, making the right connections, being educated in my field. These things will naturally improve your chances of success as they did for me. But once again, the success wasn't given to me by the law of attraction, even though I was trying to practice it. I was trying to attract abundance in my life, but the abundance itself came as a result of other factors. So a first explanation of success stories is that these results are actually rooted in the self-improvements one naturally makes in trying to attract new opportunities into their life. A second explanation is coincidence, right? So maybe it's the case that right before a blessing came into your life, you were trying to practice the law of attraction. But we have to remember that correlation does not imply causation. Just because something was present right before an event doesn't mean that it caused that event. A perfect analogy for this is an experiment done by B.F. Skinner, a psychologist who is studying a phenomenon known as operant conditioning within pigeons. Pigeons were put into a box, and food would fall into the trough every 15 seconds on a timer. What he observed is that as more and more food would be dropped, pigeons would begin to think that the action they committed right before the food dropped caused the food to drop. The pigeons actually thought that the food came as a result of their behavior, and that if they repeated these behaviors, more food would drop, even though it would have dropped regardless of what they did. This caused them to adopt crazy, superstitious behaviors in order to get more food. According to the original study, quote, one bird was conditioned to turn counterclockwise about the cage, making two or three turns between reinforcements. Another repeatedly thrust its head into one of the upper corners of the cage. A third developed a tossing response, as if placing its head beneath an invisible bar and lifting it repeatedly. Two birds developed a pendulum motion of the head and body, in which the head was extended forward and swung from right to left in a sharp movement, followed by a somewhat slower return. Another bird was conditioned to make incomplete pecking or brushing movements directed toward, but not touching, the floor. Just like food would have dropped regardless of what these pigeons did, there are many things that would have happened in a person's life regardless of what they did, whether they practiced the law of attraction or not. For example, someone at their job gets a raise. Perhaps it was the case that they started practicing the law of attraction a month ago. But perhaps it's also the case that six months ago, their boss already decided they were going to get a raise at a set date. They think it came as a result of the law of attraction when it would have came anyways regardless of what they did. And so people think that just because they practice the law of attraction right before a blessing comes, that the law of attraction caused the blessing to come when it would have happened anyway, just like the pigeons thought that their crazy movements were causing the food to drop when it would have dropped anyway. Correlation does not imply causation. A third explanation for the law of attraction success stories is a phenomenon known as selective awareness. Selective awareness is a psychological phenomenon where the mind will highlight certain events or certain occurrences that support a belief or a certain narrative while deliberately blocking out other information. Our minds become aware of stimuli they weren't aware of before because now the stimuli is deemed to be important to us. For example, people walk past loose change on the ground all the time. It's literally everywhere. The average person who is not practicing the law of attraction will probably not notice a dime or nickel if it's in front of them on the sidewalk. However, if someone has been practicing the law of attraction, they are primed to believe that the universe will send abundance their way. They say their daily affirmations for attracting finance. They set the right intentions. They visualize money flowing into their life each morning and are told to expect financial blessing. This expectation causes them to become selectively aware of events and stimuli they wouldn't have been aware of before because now they are looking for evidence that confirms their new paradigm. And all of a sudden they start noticing that loose change seems to be following them everywhere on the streets. Every dime and nickel becomes highlighted to them when before they never paid attention. They start to notice when their favorite food items go on sale, when the cashier accidentally gives them back too much change, or when they save money on gas that week. In reality, these things are happening at the exact same rate as before, only now, because they are expecting abundance to come into their life through the mechanism of selective awareness, they are simply becoming more aware of these things because they have been primed to see them as significant. So far, we have looked at a philosophical argument that the law of attraction is no law at all, and we have looked at three different, better, simpler explanations for law of attraction success stories. But what does the Bible have to say about such a practice? To be blunt, the Bible would classify trying to practice the law of attraction as being sorcery. Sorcery, by definition, is any attempt to manipulate a supernatural force using the power of your will. Energy healing or crystal healing, spell casting, and occult magic are examples of sorcery because they involve a person trying to manipulate metaphysical forces. Metaphysical means beyond the physical, and the law of attraction is premised on the idea that there is a metaphysical force in the universe that can be manipulated to your advantage. 
Whether this force exists or not, which it doesn't, the one who tries to manipulate this force, or any metaphysical force or law, is engaged in the practice of sorcery. The Bible says in Galatians 5.19 that sorcery is a work of the flesh and those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Revelation 21.8 says that the practicers of magic arts will have their place in the lake of fire. It's also an example of idolatry because we are putting something above and in the place of God in our lives. We are trusting in a mechanism in creation rather than the creator himself, which is idolatry, while also trying to manipulate something metaphysical in the process, which is sorcery. And obviously this practice can be and should be repented of, but the point is, is it is inconsistent with God's moral will for our lives. Now while there's no reason to believe that there's any such law in the universe, and while the Bible does classify this practice as being sorcery and idolatry, we do know from scripture that sorcery can open up spiritual doors to the wrong kingdom. I would argue it's the case that for those who really dive into this practice, they're opening up demonic doorways into their lives through the practice of idolatry and sorcery. And maybe it's the case that for those who have opened up demonic doorways into their lives, they're giving these demons right of way to manipulate them and deceive them. And I want to include this as a fourth possible explanation for Law of Attraction success stories. Namely, that demons are orchestrating and manipulating things in people's lives to convince them of a false narrative. And this is even more likely if you're someone such as a New Ager who has all kinds of doorways open through the practice of meditation, through the practice of yoga, through the practice of taking psychedelic drugs, chanting, trying to call on spirit guides, angels, etc. Let's imagine a girl named Sally. Sally is a former yoga teacher who is currently out of a job and she's trying to use the practice of the law of attraction to bring a new job into her life. She woke up one morning and wrote into her day planner that she's gonna go to the grocery store at 12 p.m. And as she's driving on the way to the grocery store, one of these demonic spirits who she has given right of way to because of her practice of sorcery, idolatry, and other such new age practices, begins projecting the thought form into her mind of an old childhood friend named Cindy. And she's driving and thinking, Cindy, Cindy, I can't get Cindy out of my head. Why is Cindy in my head? Cindy is also a new ager who lives out of town, but she just so happens to be driving through Sally City that day. And she's also the owner of a yoga studio and is looking to hire a new instructor. So Cindy's driving through her city and the same spirit that projected into Sally or a spirit that's partnered with that one projects into Cindy saying kombucha. Kombucha, all of a sudden I got kombucha on my mind. I just feel like I need a kombucha. I don't know why. I'm gonna rear off and go to a grocery store because I need to pick up a kombucha for myself. And they end up bumping into each other at the grocery store and they're both blown away at how the universe has brought them together at the perfect time. And now Cindy hires Sally to be her new yoga teacher and Sally is blown away at just how effective the law of attraction really is that it brought this new job into her life. When in reality, they've both opened themselves up to the demonic world and demons are just giving them projections into their minds, synchronizing things, orchestrating things in their life in order to deceive them. Now this may sound crazy to some people, but let's think about it for a minute. People play tricks on each other in the natural all the time. For example, let's say a guy is being unfaithful to his girlfriend and he knows his girlfriend's at the grocery store and he phones his buddy and says, hey, can you go to the grocery store and bump into my girlfriend, tell her, how much of an amazing time we had out last night when really he was out with another girl. But he wants to get his buddy to go run into her so that his girlfriend will be convinced by a false narrative. Just like people can communicate with one another to deceive a person, demons can communicate with one another to deceive a person. If people act and stage things in the natural to deceive a person, why should we expect anything less from demons who are infinitely more wicked? And their motive for wanting to deceive people is simple, to reinforce them in a new age paradigm and keep them away from the cross of Christ. Demons hate God, they hate people who are made in the image of God, and their main goal is to keep people eternally separated from him. And a main way they do this, especially in New Age spirituality, is by giving them false, deceptive experiences that seem to validate anti-biblical worldviews. And so some of these stories you hear from people who are deep into the New Age movement, they write $10,000 on a blank check and put it in their wallet and then someone comes up to them one day and just gives them a check for $10,000. I do think a possible explanation for this is that you have one demon telling a person to write down that number on a check. You have another one telling a person who has money, hey, go give that person $10,000 and they think, oh, the universe just put it on my heart to give this to you, I don't know why. And both of them walk away strengthened in their false deceptive new age beliefs. The natural effects of self-improvement, sheer coincidence, selective awareness, and demonic intervention are sufficient for explaining the law of attraction success stories. But the question remains, doesn't the Bible say the power of life and death is in the tongue? Doesn't the Bible teach law of attraction principles? The answer to this question is no. Let's take a look at a few reasons why the Bible does not teach the law of attraction principle. The first is that the law of attraction contradicts biblical monotheism and the way the Bible says God answers prayers. 
The Bible reveals a personal transcendent God who responds to prayers positively or negatively as an act of his own free will. By transcendent, we mean outside of space and time. By personal, we don't mean that God is a human being or that God is embodied. What we mean is that the Father is an unembodied mind that is self-aware, rational, endowed with freedom of the will, etc. God has a will, a mind, emotions, likes and dislikes, things that please him, things that displease him, etc. God isn't a mechanism to be manipulated, God is a person, and just like you can say no to the wishes and desires of your children, God can say no to the wishes and desires of his. In fact, the Bible lists some conditions under which God will not hear prayers, will not answer prayers, all of which contradict the law of attraction philosophy. Let's look at a few verses right here. God will not hear the prayers of unrepentant sinners who blatantly disregard his moral will, prayers that go against what God is willing to do, prayers motivated by wrong, selfish motives, the prayer of those who are dishonoring their wives unrepentantly, prayers that are said for attention or to impress people, prayers of those who are not born again in Christ. There is no biblical evidence that God honors prayers of those who reject Jesus, as Jesus alone is the mediator between God and man. No one comes to the Father but through Christ, and apart from Christ we are alienated from God. But even if a saved person says the right prayer for the right reasons while in right standing with God, God can still choose to say no because he has freedom in his sovereignty as a personal God to do so. The law of attraction teaches that an automatic mechanism will respond to you regardless of your relationship to Christ. The God of the Bible requires you to accept Christ, puts conditions on whether or not he will answer your prayers, and still has a right to say yes or no to those prayers. These are two totally different systems. One involves a dead mechanism that responds automatically. The other involves a living person who responds conditionally. The second reason the Bible does not teach the law of attraction is that all of the verses in the New Testament that could be twisted to support the law of attraction apply to born-again believers only, not unbelievers. These verses only carry relevance to those who have repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. These verses don't apply to people who are invested in other spiritual disciplines. When Jesus says things like, ask and it will be given to you in Matthew 7, 7, he is telling his disciples to ask, not the Pharisees. When he says, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith in Matthew 21, 22, he is saying this to those who are praying to the God of Israel in his name. Or when he says in Mark 9, 23, that all things are possible for the one who believes, he is saying all things are possible for the one who trusts in him and his ability. If we look at the context, the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, but we have to actually be in Christ in the first place. These aren't general life principles that can be extracted from the surrounding text and applied to any given situation. They have a very specific context that is limited to the followers of Jesus. So even if they did teach the law of attraction, which they don't, they wouldn't apply to non-Christians anyway. And the last reason we know the Bible does not teach the law of attraction is the Bible tells us the law of attraction is sin. As we have already seen, the Bible would classify the practice of the law of attraction as sorcery, aka magic, because we are attempting to manipulate a metaphysical force, as well as idolatry, because we end up going to and trusting in a mechanism rather than the creator himself. So automatically, it's against God's will for us. But oftentimes, depending on how it's practiced, it may also be the sin of greed, or envy, or pride. Maybe we're trying to use the law of attraction so we can indulge ourselves. Maybe we want to use the law of attraction because we're jealous of what someone else has, or because we want to boost our image in society. Even if the law of attraction were practiced with humble, sincere intentions, it would still be idolatry and sorcery. But oftentimes it dips into other types of sin as well. But what about Proverbs 18.21, where it says the power of life and death is in the tongue. Doesn't this mean I have the ability to create things with my speech? All this verse means is that we have the ability to produce good or bad fruit in other people with our speech. I have the power to create nourishment with my words, or I have the power to create discouragement with my words. This is worded differently in just a few Proverbs earlier, Proverbs 15:4, where it says a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. All Proverbs 18 is saying is that we have tremendous power with our words over the minds and hearts of other people. Now think about this for a minute. We know that in Proverbs 28 verse 9 it says that if someone turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. How weird would it be if the Bible taught God puts conditions on prayer, but also taught that you can circumvent these conditions and take a whole different route to getting what you want by speaking them into existence out of nothing. This would make the Bible to essentially say, if you have needs in your life, God will listen to your prayers under these conditions. God is in control and says that if we seek him in his righteousness, he will provide us according to what we need. But if you don't follow God, you can bypass God's laws and his conditions and have your needs met a second way 
by creating them out of thin air yourself. Clearly this is not what Proverbs 18 is trying to teach us. So far we have looked at four possible explanations for Law of Attraction success stories, and we have looked at three different biblical reasons why the Law of Attraction is incompatible with the teachings of God. We've looked at a philosophical argument that knocks down the idea that this is a law, and we've looked at some of these proof texts from scripture that clearly don't teach the Law of Attraction. Contrary to how well it is received in New Age circles and even secular circles, when tested against scripture and just basic reason, it's very clear that the Law of Attraction is no law at all and just seeks to deceive people by strengthening them in false beliefs about themselves, the universe, God, etc. Its ultimate goal is to get people to deny the need for God in their spiritual practice, then to get them to deny the need for God in any area of life at all, then to do away with God altogether, and to do away with the need for the cross altogether, and lure them into a false pantheistic theology that teaches that all things in the universe, including the universe itself, is divine. And the law of attraction really does hammock itself in this theology of pantheism, which is demonstrably false. Uh, chapter 5 in my book, The Second Coming of the New Age, is a refutation of pantheism as taught in the New Age movement. If you take away the idea that the universe is divine, you take away the idea of the law of attraction. Now, anything contrary to the truth won't serve you. And the truth is, the best thing you could do for yourself is repent of your sins and trust in Christ for your salvation, turning your entire life over to him. It might not give you the horse ranch you want, or the CEO position that you want, but God promises us if we seek him first and his righteousness, he will take care of us according to our needs. Maybe not according to our wants, but according to our needs. As a good earthly father will provide for his children, God will provide for his children as he sees fit, not as how the child sees fit. And so the choice is yours. You can be a fellow heir with Christ and be a recipient of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Or you cannot partner with God, not partner with the one who is sovereign, who loves you, who controls and oversees all things, and try to use a mechanism that, as we have seen, doesn't even exist. So, my sisters have challenged me to do a yoga self-challenge. You know, where you try to challenge yourself to do all types of yoga poses. Although it's not really a self-challenge because they also sent me the list of poses they'd like me to try. Hey guys, Steve here. In this video, we're going to review an animated Barbie video teaching children how to do yoga stretches. I want to use this as a teaching opportunity of what yoga actually means, what these specific postures or asanas Barbie is holding actually mean, and what her chanting of the word Om means. I want us to have a sober realization of how much pagan spirituality is influencing our culture today, but most importantly, I want us to have the knowledge we need to know why this practice is a grievance to the Holy Spirit and a transgression of God's commands. This may take some people by surprise, but I would encourage you to withhold judgment until you see the information provided in this video. We won't do a comprehensive overview of yoga in this video as we will save that for the future, but we will cover some elementary issues and analyze the poses she does so we can answer the question, is this something we or our children should be involved in? While this animation may seem sweet and well-intentioned, the information we are about to look at may shock you, even if you aren't a Christian. So let's dive in. I love doing yoga. I try to practice it every single day. And it's called yoga practice because it's not really about perfecting or mastering a move. It's about the practicing of it. It's the journey. It's actually called yoga practice because it's a spiritual practice with the goal of bringing you into a state of unity with Brahman, the impersonal divine force and consciousness that makes up everything in creation. The word yoga means union, and it refers to a union, quote, between one's individual consciousness and the universal consciousness. Therefore, yoga refers to a certain state of consciousness as well as to methods that help one reach the goal or state of union with the divine. Subhas Tiwari, a professor at the Hindu University of America with a master's in yogic philosophy, clarifies this for us. The simple immutable fact is that yoga originated from the Vedic or Hindu culture. Its techniques were not adopted by Hinduism, but originated from it. Efforts to separate yoga from its spiritual center reveal ignorance of the goal of yoga. It was intended by the Vedic seers as an instrument which can lead one to apprehend the absolute ultimate reality called the Brahma reality, or God. The essence of yoga is to reach oneness with God. The reason it's called practice is because it's a spiritual practice of bringing your soul into unity with the supreme mystical force, the ground of being out of which all things arise, Brahman. 
This is why even Webster's Dictionary defines it as, quote, a Hindu theistic philosophy, teaching the suppression of all activity of body and mind and will in order that the self may realize its distinction from them and attain liberation. The stretching postures called asanas, the breath work, and the chanting, which Barbie does at the end of the video for us, are all meant to facilitate a spiritual experience in the practitioner. What's more troubling is, as we will see, some of these postures are meant to honor and invoke the properties of Hindu gods as well. Let's keep watching to find out what these postures actually mean and see if this is something we want to involve ourselves in, let alone expose our children to. All right, let's see what they have in store. Uh, from Chelsea. What? Chelsea? <laughs> okay, I'll choose the first pose. Balancing table pose. This pose is actually called sunbird pose, or in Sanskrit, Kakravakasana, named after a duck-like bird called the Chakravaka in Hindu mythology who is believed to live on the rays of the moon. They are believed to be people who have been punished with the incarnation of a duck for interrupting the meditation of sages in their past life. Sounds kind of silly, but at the same time, the origin of this stretch is a bird in pagan mythology. Let's keep watching. Okay, from Skipper, King Dancer pose. Figure she'd pick that one. King Dancer Pose is also known as Natarajasana, and it is named after Nataraja, one of Shiva's eight different forms. Shiva is one of the supreme gods in Hinduism, and he assumed a form called Nataraja when he performed a cosmic dance in the mystical center of the universe. According to Yoga Journal, Nataraja is another name for Shiva, and his dance symbolizes cosmic energy. Here is a sculpture of Shiva in this dance form where, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Shiva is shown as the source of all movement within the cosmos and as the god whose doomsday dance, represented by the Ark of Flames, accompanies the dissolution of the universe at the end of an eon. So when we hold King Dancer pose, also known as a Lord of the Dance pose, we are literally imitating Shiva and, quote, paying a tribute to this powerful god of destruction by holding a pose that is meant to symbolize a dance he did. Another yoga source online tells us that this pose, quote, honors the lord of the dance by holding this asana in remembrance of Nataraja. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 verse 1 to, quote, be imitators of God, but you can't imitate God at the same time you are imitating Shiva. You can't imitate the God of Scripture and a different God from a different religion. Colossians 3.17 tells us whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can't perform a pose named after Shiva in the name of the Lord Jesus. You can't do Natarajasana in the name of Jesus because it's being done in the name of Shiva, literally. You also can't pay tribute to Shiva and glorify God in your body at the same time, like we are commanded to do in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 20. To honor, worship, and imitate Shiva with our bodies when we are told to honor, worship, and imitate God alone is to commit the sin of idolatry, something God tells us to flee from in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 14. But later, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 20, Paul tells us this, What pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Paul was saying this to tell Christians in Corinth to stop having feasts at pagan temples, because by partaking in temple ceremony, they are partaking of the table of demons. In other words, there is a demon behind every idolatrous practice, whether you are involved in temple food offerings like Corinth was, or paying homage to the god of Hinduism with your body like the West does. And when we partake in idolatrous practices, we are in sin, in relationship with the demonic, according to Paul, and outside of God's protection. Okay, another one from Stacy, Warrior 3. Um, okay, that'll be fun to try. Let's see. This is the third of three warrior poses that have the proper name Virabhadrasana, named after an incarnation of Shiva when he took the form of a warrior called Virabhadra. According to Yogapedia, an incarnation of Shiva, Virabhadra, was created to destroy Daksha, the son of Brahma. According to legend, Daksha opposed the marriage of Shiva to his daughter Sati and cut her off from the family. The story varies depending on the Hindu tradition, but Sati eventually killed herself. In his grief, Shiva created Virabhadra to exact revenge. So Shiva manifests as this fearsome, violent Virabhadra with a thousand heads and a thousand flaming eyes to kill Daksha because Daksha wouldn't let him marry his daughter. The first two warrior poses are Virabhadra preparing for combat against Daksha. And Warrior 3 pose is the final pose of the warrior sequence where we imitate Shiva cutting off the head of Daksha. This is the pose kids are learning to do in this Barbie video. The shape of Virabhadrasana, or Warrior 3, comes from this story. 
the moment when Varabhadra beheads the king Daksha and extends forward to place his head on a stake. So this pose is meant to imitate the beheading and also the setting of the head of Daksha on a stake. Now the Bible tells us, do not present your members, which means your limbs, your body parts, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members, your body parts, to God as instruments of righteousness. Are your body parts being presented to Yahweh as instruments of righteousness when they are being used to imitate Varabhadra killing Daksha? We are further told to, quote, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Is mimicking a polytheistic murder scene with your body an example of presenting your body wholly unto God? In Philippians 1 verse 20, Paul tells us that he wishes that Christ would be honored in his body, which can't happen if you're honoring Shiva in your body. We are literally incapable of obeying these commandments when holding this asana. Let's keep watching. All right, Ugh, time for my favorite pose. Savasana. This is for Chelsea. What's your favorite yoga pose? <laughs> Pace. Om. Notice her chanting of Om here. In Mantra Yoga and Primal Sound by David Frawley, quote, Om is the prime mantra of the higher self, or Atman. It attunes us with our true nature. It is the sound of the creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe, who is also the inner guru and prime teacher. It reflects both the manifest and unmanifest Brahman, sustaining the vibration of being, life, and consciousness in all worlds and all creatures. Open your mouth wide enough and utter the sound The belief in Hinduism is that Om is the sacred sound out of which all creation emanates. According to Yoga Journal, as we exhale the Om, its vibration links us to the original source of creation. When done properly, the sound reverberates from the pelvic floor upward through the crown of the head, filling the body with pulsating energy that simultaneously empowers and radiates tranquility. The purpose of chanting Om is to initiate a state of consciousness in oneself whereby we enter into unity with the mystical cosmic source of all being usually involving a trance-like state of mind. In other words, the purpose of chanting Om is to initiate a deceptive spiritual experience rooted in a false worldview and false theology. We have also seen how yoga is a spiritual practice shaped around Hindu mysticism, and we have seen how some of the postures are meant to honor and imitate Hindu deities, a recipe for demonic oppression. I do want to answer just one question some of you may have. A person may say, well, sure, this is all concerning, but I don't see it as a spiritual practice, and I don't treat it that way. I treat it as just being a physical practice and I ignore the spiritual part. The question is not how do we see it and how do we treat it. The question is how does God see it and how does God treat it. From the verses we have read, do we think God looks down with fatherly pleasure seeing Christians, little children, or anybody for that matter, honoring and imitating Shiva with their bodies as part of a spiritual system meant to bring them into unity with Brahman? Even if we choose to ignore the meaning and origin of yoga and its postures, that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit chooses to ignore it along with us. We can't assume that just because we overlook the spiritual roots and purpose of a practice that God overlooks it too. For example, when an unbeliever or someone in unrepentant sin takes communion, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11.29 that that person eats and drinks judgment onto themselves for not discerning the body of the Lord. Because they ignored the spiritual significance of the physical actions of eating bread, which represents the body of Jesus, and drinking grape juice or wine, which represents the blood of Jesus, in communion, they reaped spiritual consequences, such as sickness and even death. Because God sees communion as being spiritual in nature, a Hindu can't walk into a church and take communion just because he wants a snack. It doesn't matter how the Hindu sees it. For a Christian to try to ignore the purpose and origin of yoga and its postures and say they just want to stretch is arguably the same in God's eyes as a Hindu trying to ignore the purpose and origin of communion because he's hungry. People in the Old and New Testament never tried to redeem a pagan practice, they scrapped it altogether. Because remember, the question is not how do we see it, the question is how does God, who calls us to spiritual perfection. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God didn't want Christians involved in pagan practices in 1 Corinthians 10 when they were involved in pagan worship, God wouldn't want us partaking in pagan worship now. We instead should get our back stretches from a personal trainer, a chiropractor, or a physiotherapist, all of which can be found on YouTube, online, and make sure we are being imitators of God alone in our bodies.
In the New Age movement, the second coming is actually believed to be a metaphor for the arrival of Christ consciousness within each person. It's simply a metaphor for the arrival of a divine state of consciousness that will incarnate, in a sense, within millions of people as they begin to awaken to their true divine nature. As Eckhart Tolle says, the second coming of Christ is a transformation of human consciousness, a shift from time to presence, from thinking to pure consciousness, not the arrival of some man or woman. If Christ were to return tomorrow in some externalized form, what could he or she say to you other than this? I am the truth. I am divine presence. I am eternal life. I am within you. I am here. I am now. In titling this work, The Second Coming of Christ, I am not referring to a literal return of Jesus to earth. He came 2,000 years ago and, after imparting a universal path to God's kingdom, was crucified and resurrected. His reappearance to the masses now is not necessary for the fulfillment of his teachings. What is necessary is for the cosmic wisdom and divine perception of Jesus to speak again through each one's own experience and understanding of the infinite Christ consciousness that was incarnate in Jesus. That will be his true second coming. The second coming will be a shift in consciousness that renews human nature by raising it to the level of the divine. So we have seen what New Age teachers say about the second coming. Now let's take a look at what Jesus and the Apostle Paul have to say about the second coming. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of earth to the other. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And we could look at about 60 other verses on the second coming that tell us the exact same thing as these, but from these four verses alone, here is what we can deduce from them about the second coming of Jesus. He will descend from heaven. He will come with great glory. He will come with his angels. We will see him in the clouds and sky. All the nations of the earth will mourn and wail when they see him. So as we can see, the second coming metaphor does not meet a single one of these descriptions of what Jesus said the second coming of him will be like. Here is a presentation on Christ consciousness given by Muji, and the New Age will tell us that the second coming is happening in people all over this room right now. But notice how nobody is wailing or mourning. There is also no Jesus or angels in the clouds when the second coming is apparently happening within these people. It's just a bunch of people sitting there when Jesus clearly describes his second coming as being a physical and apocalyptic event. So the first point is that this idea of the second coming being a metaphor for an inner awakening does not mean any description of what Jesus and the apostles say his second coming will be like. The second point is that the New Testament tells us specifically that the second coming will be of Jesus as a person. Of the 60 to 70 verses that speak about the second coming, every single one says specifically that Jesus himself, as a person, is coming back a second time. For example, all of the verses we just read, or where it says in 2 Thessalonians, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted, as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, 1 Peter 4.13, Colossians 3.4, and Hebrews 9.28 speak of the second coming as Christ coming back. And these verses are the only hope for the second coming metaphor because if it says Christ, then the word Christ can be redefined to mean a state of consciousness. This is why the word Christ is in quotation marks in the Eckhart Tolle quote, because what he does is slip in a new definition of the word Christos, and he turns Christ from a he, a person, to an it. Now looking at three verses, there's a problem here because the author of 1 Peter and Colossians, who is Paul, speak about the second coming of Jesus himself in other verses in the New Testament. So we know that they mean it's a coming of Jesus, not Christ as a state of consciousness. And the verse in Hebrew speaks of Christ as a him, a person, who was offered up for the sins of the people. So every single verse about the second coming in the New Testament is a reference to Jesus himself coming back as a person. If the second coming of Jesus is really about an awakening to a state of consciousness, why don't we find a single verse speaking of the second coming as being anything other than the return of Jesus himself? Not only are there no verses that speak about a metaphorical second coming, there are not even any verses that could be twisted to mean a metaphorical second coming because of how they all speak of Jesus himself as a person. A third point, which is kind of a funny one, Jesus says that nobody knows when the second coming is going to happen, not even himself, yet the New Age is telling us it's already happening and has been happening for the last 2,000 years. Jesus says in Mark 13, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. 
So if Jesus says he didn't even know when his second coming would be, how does Eckhart Tolle? To say it's happening now is to say you know the day and the hour, but Jesus himself didn't even know the day and the hour. And the fourth point is that this presupposes a false philosophy. Jesus warned against those who say I am Christ or here is Christ. The greatest man ever, according to Jesus, denied being Christ. This philosophy parallels the lie told in the Garden of Eden that we can become like God. It requires a redefining of the word Christos, and the Bible tells us specifically that we are not God. This entire theory hinges upon a philosophy that Jesus himself warned of in Matthew 24 as being a sign of deception in the end times. In reality, scripture couldn't be any more clear that the second coming is meant to be physical. For example, when it says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. If the Apostle Paul were trying to communicate to us that the second coming really was literal, how much more clear could he be than this? It's extremely clear from the words of Jesus and the Apostles that the second coming is literal, not metaphorical. It's physical, not metaphysical. And the most interesting characteristic of the second coming is that it says all the nations of the earth will mourn and wail and be cut to the heart with grief at the second coming. And this only makes sense if the second coming is literal. And the reason this will happen is because when we all see him coming back, it's all over. Our philosophies, our opinions, our lifestyle will all be confronted with the supernatural presence of Jesus. And the Bible says people will mourn like they lost the first son because they will be hit with the awareness of their eternal separation from God. And that's a terrifying realization. This will be the impact of the second coming globally, not a shift towards Christ consciousness or personal spiritual experience. It's described by Jesus as being a physical descent from heaven accompanied by angels, an experience that will cause people to literally be caught up in the air with him and will cause intense grief and mourning to those who rejected him. It's the end of human history as we know it. And this is really why I make these videos is because I want people to find the truth in Jesus while we are still alive and while we still have time to do so. Jesus loves you and died for you. And through believing on him, we can be saved from our sin and reconciled back to God. And it's not just some dry religious thing. When we do this, we receive an indwelling of the Holy Spirit who guides us and helps us in our walk with the Lord. It's the Spirit of the Lord himself. This is the Jesus of the New Testament and the Jesus that entered into human history and the one who promised to enter our world one last time. And I pray that those of you watching will be caught up in the air with the Lord, like Paul says, or coming back with the angels alongside Jesus. Because this is the kind of radical supernatural worldview Jesus really taught. He claimed to be the King of Heaven. He claimed to be God incarnate, the sacrifice for human sins. He claimed to be someone far more glorious, divine, and powerful than the New Age makes him out to be. And his claims about himself were all vindicated by his resurrection from the dead. So if we want to know the truth about the second coming, we don't have to look any further than the words of Jesus himself, who promised that he will be coming back physically, with power, and to rule and reign. I would encourage all those who are watching this to make a decision to avoid this practice. As someone who is speaking from experience, it does nothing except strengthen you in your own self-deception. Make a decision today to press into relationship with Jesus Christ as your source of nurture and fulfillment. Jesus does not promise OBEs to those who repent and follow him, but he does promise spiritual intimacy and eternal life beyond the grave. The part of us that craves the supernatural can be satisfied by relationship with the supernatural God who made you. And all the questions we have about who we are and why we are here are answered in his word. When we begin to explore spirituality outside the boundaries of his lordship, we play ourselves into the hands of a demonic kingdom that is determined to lead us into deception and destruction. The best thing you can do for your spiritual development is forsake this practice, ask Jesus Christ to forgive you for your involvement with it, and put your trust in him alone for your salvation. Because all of the longing you have for things beyond this world can only be satisfied by an intimate relationship with God and the eternal life he promises to those who repent and believe on his son.